Ladies and gentlemen, recorded in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. It's time for Fight Night Picks with your host, Frank and Matt Allen. And welcome back with Fight Night Picks. As always, one half of your hosting duo, Craig Allen. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Craig Allen FNP. With me to my left, to your right, as always, on the respective socials, it's Matt Allen. At Matt Allen FNP. Now, we're coming off the heels of UFC 274 for Fight Night Picks. It was more or less bad. I'm just happy it was a slight positive on my end. But regardless, it was an amazing end of the card with Charles Oliveira getting the win. I'd say keeping the belt, but not really. Hopefully getting a fight against like an Islam Makachev or Michael Chandler who put Tony Ferguson on a poster. You saw the highlight here on our YouTube channel or you saw Tony's face going around the social medias looking a little bit like Frankie Edgar when he Real fought sad. Marlon Vera. Very, very sad though, Matt, but it was a crazy event, wasn't it? It was a great event. That's the thing. Sometimes the predictions aren't great, but the fight card does deliver and the fight card definitely did. And looking towards this weekend's card, we have another pretty good one. Honestly, I'm really excited for this main event. Jan Blahovich is making his highly anticipated return. People forget recency bias in MMA is bad, Craig. This guy beat Israel out of Sonya. That's kind of a big deal. He then went on to maybe kind of lose to Glover to share in a lackluster performance, but he is looking to rebuild himself against who at one point was probably the number one contender. He did sort of lose it due to inactivity. Rakic was what we almost look at as kind of the half number one contender where it's like, hey, if you win another one soon, you'll definitely get that title shot. He chose to stay on the shelf. It didn't really work out for him, but this fight against Blahovic is just a great fight for both guys. And for Alexander Rakic, last time we saw him out against Thiago Santos, it was a decision win for Rakic. It was back at UFC 259. Blahovich versus Adesanya. For Blahovich, we saw him fight late in the fall. If you do look at this overall card, though, a lot of interesting matchups. Ryan Spann's got a big dance against Iwan Kutsalaba, a guy who's looked very good with his new gym yes. of Extreme Couture. You do have some UFC debuts on this card, but listen, if we did anything right last week and we hit the nail on the head with a one-round fight of the night, you had Brandon Royval match. Now we'll throw it on over to our fight of the night screen. Let us know down below in that comment section who you have to pick up the ever-elusive fight of the night bonus because, listen, 11 fights, it's either very easy or very difficult. Throw it on over to the fight of the night screen. Let us know down below in the comment section who you've got. It's time for the fight of the night with Fight Night Picks. So Frank Camacho debuted in the UFC, kind of like Lando Venata. He won three fight of the night bonuses in a row. But if you look at it for Camacho, he's been out for almost two years. He's two and five with the promotion. He had a major car accident in 2021 that kind of really had to make his bout against Matt Frivola, the second booking of that bout. Fizzle out. He's got a fight coming up this weekend against debuting Entram Jim's own Manuel Torres. And if you've ever seen Torres fight, this guy is kind of like a banshee. But in his last fight, very technical against Colton Anglin. Colton Anglin on Dana White's Contender Series. And a little bit of Herb Dean in my life. A little bit of Herb Dean. Was there an eye rake? A little bit of Herb Maybe. Dean. What we need? A little bit of Herb Dean. I hope we have him this weekend. And listen, I love Mambo Number no. 5, but listen, Mambo Number no. 5 doesn't hold a candle to Camacho Torres. I think this one's going to be fun while it lasts. This isn't the, we think these guys are going to be champions in the future screen. This is, this fight's going to be awesome screen. And I do agree with you. Manuel Torres, if you've watched anything about him, you love the aggression he brings into the cage. And for Frank Camacho, you're right. He got off to an insane start to his UFC career. He might not have won every fight, but it was extremely memorable. And honestly, that means more than a lot of wins can in a lot of cases. But it has been a rough road for him. But the great thing about Camacho is he always comes to fight and put on one of those fight of the night type performances. So... For this being Manuel Torres' first introduction to the UFC, it should be a great fight for him. Big time fight coming up. And listen, for Camacho, it's not like he's fighting Jeff Neal or Benil Dariush again. So Manuel Torres, big opportunity. And the second pick for the fight of the night screen, Davey still in the Navy Grant, taking on Louis Smolka, the last samurai. And for Smolka, it was a wild run the first time he was in the UFC. Then he went abroad. He won quite a few fights. He comes back. And makes things interesting. He beat Sumaderji. That was fun, right? Remember that? It was. And now it's kind of been so-so. He did lose to Vince Morales. First round TKO his last time out. But for Davey Grant, his last time out maybe slowed a little bit against a super boxer in Adrian Yanez. 
I think this one, a couple of guys that really need to prove themselves for a win, this should be a fun fight. David Grant always comes to fight. Normally guys get safer with age, but David Grant has done the exact opposite. Was known far more as a grappler early on in his career, but David Grant comes to throw hands at this stage, and it's kind of wild. He may have lost his last two fights, but they were to Marlon Vera. Don't know if you've heard of him. He's very, very good. But that was a pretty close fight. It was arguably fight of the year a couple years ago, or I guess last year. And then, like you said, lost a pretty close fight to Adrian Yanez, one of the best prospects in this division. And for Smolka, this is his second run in the UFC, but if Julian Rose has proven anything, it's that if you have really slick jiu-jitsu and just a really cardio-based game, you can make it far and have really fun fights, and I expect this to be a very good one. So listen, that's two out of a possible 11. You hit us up down below in that comment section. Let us know who you have as a possible fight in the night because there's only so many possibilities. Let us know down below in the comment section. All right, so realistically, we like to boil things down right before we get into the predictions. You have the UFC debut of the former EFC and Cage Warriors flyweight champion. It's Jake Hadley. Dana White was very cryptic when he gave Jake Hadley his contract. There were some issues on the scale, some issues backstage. Jake Hadley was crying. And then they give him the shot in the UFC, and he's since had two boats kind of been shuffled around. Like, Nicholas Cage would have to make a National Treasure 3 to figure out what the heck's going on behind the scenes. Either way, he's got a fight coming up against Alain Nascimento, a training partner of one Charles Oliveira. You also have the UFC debut of the aforementioned Manuel Torres out of a big-time gym and end-time gym. No more Brandon Moreno there, though, because he's Glory MMA and fitness his own as it is. But that should be a very, very interesting one. And if I look through it, nine total rank fighters. Blahovich, you've got Rakic, Span, Chukagian, Hibas, you've got Arujao Lee, Jandy Doba, and Angela Hill. So listen... To have nine ranked fighters and 11 fights on a fight night card, you can't be disappointed in that one. Exactly, and I feel like Caitlin Chukagin versus Amanda Heboss is honestly like a pay-per-view main card type of a fight. Like, that's an important fight for both fighters in their division. Chukagin's the number one contender at 125, if Jessica Andrade didn't exist, of course. And then Amanda Heboss... No, Hibos, she actually is. Uh, uh, she is, but it's weird, because that's the thing, Andrade is kind of in between the two divisions, and she's probably the number one contender in both, because she was able to knock out Chukagin. But for Heboss, she's been jumping between... Between 125 and 115 and look pretty good doing it at both divisions but she is kind of behind what we consider the top tier talent in both weight classes so I honestly think that's gonna be a really fun fight this been flying under the radar this week he bossed his last win at 125 pounds was a quick submission win over Paige Van Zant. now she's gonna look to take on the number one ranked contender in the division in Caitlin Chukagan I think this is gonna be a fun one I think it's gonna be a short one I think it's gonna be an enjoyable one and if you haven't already toss us a sub Toss that like on the channel because it would certainly be appreciated. And hey, we're also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and your locally uh, subscribed pod catcher. So it could be Google. It could be whatever. Pod, you name it. CastBox. That's another one. Wow. We're out there as well. Rate and review. It definitely helps out the show. I am full of enthusiasm on a Sunday night getting ready for the fights. So keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. And as we always say, let's get into it. Coming up this weekend at middleweight, we have a couple of guys that are 2-0 in their young UFC careers. It's Nick Maximov taking on Andre Petrovsky. And listen, these two guys starting to carve out very interesting spots in this middleweight division for Petrovsky. He was a competitor on the last season of The Ultimate Fighter. He picks up a big win over Aaron Phillips in the first round of the tournament. And of course, for Petrovsky, if you didn't watch that season like me... He was a second pick for Team Ortega at middleweight. Now, what I had to do getting ready for Maximov and for Petrowski was kind of factor in how they made out outside of the UFC, how they made out on the Ultimate Fighter, on Dana White's Contender Series, and really blend it all together with the two performances that they've had inside of the UFC's Octagon. Now, it gets really weird. And I'm going to craft a story for you. So you've got Petrowski. He's a guy. He's fought with CFFC. He fought Aaron Jeffrey. You look at the overall record for him. Decent level of competition. But of course, has a strong round against Jeffrey early on. And ends up kind of starting to let the wheels fall off in the second round against him. So he loses that fight. Then he ends up in the Ultimate Fighter. Beats Phillips. Loses to the eventual champ in Brian Battle. 
But they love Andre Petrowski so much. They it do. seemed like he was kind of the big focal point of the season. I mean, look at the guy. He's he half... was the Artem Lobov of that season. He's halfway marketable. So they bring him back and they give him a law ball if there ever were one in Michael Gilmore. And listen, I don't want to take anything away from Michael Gilmore. Is he still in the UFC? Not necessarily, but he was an alternate. He quit his job. He ended up on the season. It didn't even happen. And then ultimately they went, okay, champ, well, we're going to give you a shot in the big dance. And he loses to Petrowski. Then he loses his next fight. Oh, but for Petrowski, looked good in positions, won the fight, but at distance did get lit up. And for Michael Gilmore, a former WKA uh, striker, and you like the lineage that he possessed. And when he was able to let his hands go and let his kicks go, Gilmore didn't look too bad, but we know how good Petrowski is as a wrestler. His father went to Penn State, he was a wrestling coach, he was a karate coach, and Andre definitely fits that mold. I mean, even if you look at Andre Petrowski back in December, the day before New Year's Eve, he was competing at a big-time grappling tournament against Phil Haas. Won that by decision, I thought Phil Haas won, but I don't really decide grappling tournaments, so you really factor it in. Petrowski goes out there his last time out, and they went, okay. We're playing lob pitch with Michael Gilmore. Hit this one off a tee. Here's Hu Yao Zhang. Three and two Hu Yao Zhang. They came into the UFC at heavyweight, then had a fight at light heavyweight, then took a ton of time off and fought at middleweight. Petrovsky was able to get the win in the third round by submission. And for me, the biggest thing that I liked out of that was the fact that Petrovsky didn't look totally depleted by the time that third round came around. He wasn't completely gassed like I've kind of seen him do in some of his other fights. You're right, he wasn't completely gassed, but he is a fighter who does seem to rely a lot on his physical strength, and that's fine. If you're built like Andre Petrovsky, you'd probably rely on how big your muscles are. It would make a lot of sense, but in this matchup against Nick Maximov, it should be interesting, because Maximov will fight at a very steady pace. It's not going to be at maybe the most visually pleasing pace, if we're all being honest, but he does like to keep a very steady pace throughout his fights, and he does that with his grappling nine times out of ten, and this fight hopefully is not decided on the feet, because if we are treated to 50 15 minutes of these two striking. It's not going to be a great fight if we're all being honest, even though I do think Petrovsky is probably the better striker. He is kind of wild with his strikes, and you do see that throughout his fight. It's a, that is a good point that you bring up. At distance, a lot of the times, he's not great defensively, and he does carry his hands quite low. So if you are a really accurate striker, like, I can't believe I say this, Carl Roberson probably keeps him up at night. He's very accurate from the outside. He can hit you with a 1-2 before you can blink. For Petrovsky... Nick Maximo was actually booked to take on Carl Robertson at one point. Exactly. But for Petrovsky, I do think he's going to struggle with those upper echelon strikers. Now, Nick Maximo, not that guy whatsoever, so it probably won't come in to bite him at this fight. But Petrovsky will still need to grapple at some point if he's going to win this fight. I really doubt he is even confident enough in his own striking to think, hey, I'm going to go out there and kickbox for 15 minutes and probably win this fight. He could score a stoppage early because, again, he does have pretty good power in his hands when he lets them go, but I wouldn't rely on him to go out there and win a stand-up oriented fight against Maximov, and that's where I do look at this fight. I'm assuming it's going to hit the mat at some point, and the thing about Maximov is, is he like a Charles Oliveira type grappler who is going to go from guard and jump to the back and go to a triangle into the back again? Well, that was the bill of goods that we were sold before he was on Dana White's Contender it was. Series. We were told this guy was basically Gordon Ryan, but he could pass the USADA test. Now, is he a really good grappler? Yes, he is. Nick Maximov is phenomenal on the mat, and he has looked really good in his grappling in the UFC up until this point. But does he threaten with a ton of submissions? Not really. If guys are struggling to get back up to their feet, he can take advantage of them. The similar as to ways that guys take advantage of like Derek Lewis when he's trying to get up to uh, his feet. If you're really lazy about it, Nick Maximov can threaten with a rear naked choke and get to your back fast. But he's very methodical with his grappling. And that's really the point I want to hammer home. People try to compare him to, like, Nate Diaz, Nate Diaz, Nick Diaz. Oh, he's so offensive. He's so great with his jiu-jitsu. He's a lot more like Jake Shields, who people sometimes forget is from that same kind of camp and from that same lineage. Maximov is much more position over submission, and I do think that's going to help him a lot in this fight against Petrovsky, because if he is going to threaten with a submission here or there, that will create space that will allow Petrovsky to maybe explode out and get back up to his feet. But since Maximov does play it quite safe on the mat, I do think he should be able to just methodically work his way to a decision. Well, so here's the thing. I mean, you consider both these guys. You talked about the camp for Maximo, Nick Diaz, Academy. You see him working with coach Randy Spence, Chris Avila. 
a guy who doesn't like Anthony Pretty Boy Taylor, a guy who fought Artem Lobov at one point. Second Artem Lobov reference in the show, but for Maximo, training with those guys, he always seems to have headgear on on his Instagram. 39% striking defense in the three fights, Dana White's Contender Series and two in the UFC. And for Maximo, this is what I want to drive home. So the fight that he had against Oscar Cota, which was a heavyweight, and Maximo barely weighed above light heavyweight for that one. He was able to go 2 of 5 in takedown attempts with 11 minutes and 14 seconds of control time. Takes on Cody Brundage, goes 4 of 15 on takedown attempts, 9 minutes and 21 seconds of control time. Takes on Puna Soriano, goes 11 of 16 on takedown attempts for 8 minutes and 45 seconds of control time. Nick Maximo is also a decent favorite. I'll talk about that in just a second. But I think he's a big favorite because he beat Puna Heli Soriano, Who's and that's the thing? only reason... That fight was really close. I know Maximov ends up winning it. Soriano had the better strikes. Maximov had takedowns and control time, and that's what won him that fight. He didn't do much with it other than control and switch from position to position. For Petrovsky, though, the Gilmore fight, the fight against Hu Yao Zhang, he goes 4-9 of nine on takedown attempts for 7 minutes and 38 seconds of control time over Gilmore, gets the finish. Takes on Hu Yao Zhang, goes 4-8 of eight on takedown attempts, 9 minutes and 39 seconds of control time, gets the finish in that fight. So both of these guys, very grappling oriented, very control, not control time oriented, but you get what I'm saying. Position over the submission, but they will get certain finishes. We haven't seen it from Maximo in the UFC or on Contender Series, we have seen it from Petrovsky. But again, 6-3 and three, Michael Gilmore, 3-2 and two, Hu Yao Zhang. So the odds in this fight, Maximo have opened to minus 250, and he's now at a minus 393 for Petrovsky, open plus 210, now at a plus 303. So I took those right before we do this, because I just write down the odds right before I hit film. So I, I, I try not to let the thoughts creep into my mind. You but say I, this every episode. I, I did go don't. and type in to see what minus 393 was for impro- implied probability. 79.7% implied probability that Maximov would win. If we have a look at the fan vote over on Topology, surprise to us that it is to you. I'm going to set the over under at 85% Maximov. I'll say under. I'm going to say under. Oh, man. 568 total votes, 85% Maximo, 75% by decision. For the 15% that are Petrovsky, 53% by decision. You got another 28% by knockout. Matt, to say that Nick Maximo is going to win this fight just about 80% of the time, I think is insane. It's absolutely insane. I think Petrovsky wins more than three times out of 10. I do. Are you picking Petrovsky then? No, I'm picking Maximo, but I just think the odds are really silly in this one. They are a little ridiculous, but this is the big difference between these two fighters in this fight. Nick Maximo can fight off his back. I don't think Andre Petrovsky can fight Nick Maximo off of his back if Maximo is on top of him. Maximo, again, it might not be the most aesthetically pleasing grappling you've ever seen in your life, but it is effective. You brought up all the control time. That's what he's really good at. When he gets you down to the ground, it's not often his opponents can get back up to their feet unless they do give up an arm, give up a neck that will allow him to threaten with some kind of a submission that will then allow him to get even more ground control time. So the odds might be a little cooked, but I still see Maximo being the winner. Nick Maximo, former All-American junior college wrestler and Franje Petrovsky definitely comes from that ilk as well with his wrestling. Again, I give a striking advantage to Petrovsky. I like the high motor out of the younger fighter in Maximo. So I am taking him in this one. But I think you stay away from this fight. You watch it with some pop and some popcorn. You burn the first one off the card. And then you have 10 fights left. So both of us going with Nick Maximov in this one. Out of the Nick Diaz Academy. And a big time main event at light heavyweight. Coming up with Jan Blahovic. Take on Alexander Rakic. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's get into it. Big time fight coming up this weekend at Flyway. We have Japan's Tatsuro Taira taking on New England's own Carlos Candelario. A fight that was scheduled a couple of weeks ago, but unfortunately it was a late scratch at the final hour with Candelario dropping off the card. So the promotion decided to rebook it. We've already talked about it at length. We're going to throw it on back to that original video, update the odds, and give you a final pick and prediction on this one. Listen, Japanese MMA fans, stand up! The former Shuto flyweight champ Tatsuro Taira making his UFC debut against the New England cartel's own Carlos the Cannon. 
Candelario, and this is a fight I know a lot of people can get behind because if you're a fan of Japanese MMA and you're looking at the UFC, you're going to see not a lot of Japanese MMA fighters. I mean, Matt and I talked about it before we started filming, but realistically, you have Takashi Sato, you have Mizuki Inoue, you also have Kanako Murata, and that's it. Like, I find that really hard to believe until you really dig into it. I mean, you think about it, the UFC purchased pride, there was so much talent, and now it's just... It's kind of in an odd place. You never see shows in Japan, or very rarely you ever do. And long gone are the days of Yushin Okami taking on Anderson Silva multiple times. So coming up this weekend for Tatsuro Taeda, this guy's on an absolute tear. I mean, his amateur career was insane. His pro career, he's already 10-0 and 0 at the ripe old age of 22 and 3 months. And the things that this guy is able to do inside of the cage really is impressive. Now, he's taking on a Candelario who... Well, very rarely do we ever see fighters get signed to the UFC off a loss, but that's where he finds himself because Dana White disagreed with the judges in the split decision win that Victor Altamirano was able to get over him on Dana White's Contender Series. And I have a lot to say about that fight that kind of plays into this one. But if you know anything about the styles of these two guys, it should result in a fun fight because Candelario likes to grapple, likes that top pressure, likes the ground to pound and the submissions. Tatsuro Taeda is one of the more... How could I say it? Technical guys, when he figures out the position, that the exact position that he wants, when he's on the ground, doesn't rush too fast. He really, really does take his time. But man, this guy's slick once it gets to that mat. Sometimes we talk about fighters at middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight, and how they grapple like people who are smaller than themselves. Like, Antonio Carlos Jr. is always a guy who comes to mind. He's a little sloppy on the feet and whatnot, but when it comes to grappling, he can uh, scramble very, very fast, and look, he looks super high level. Look at what he did in the first round of his fight last week. Tatsuzo is kind of the opposite of that. He grapples like someone much bigger than himself. He gets a lot of odd trip takedowns from the clinch, and if you've watched any of his film you can tell how physically strong he is he's someone who does really like to get on the inside of his fighters and try to work that clinch exchange he'll go for knee taps he'll go for some upper body throws too it's a really high level wrestling game that he does have and like you said he's only 22 years old and the fact that he's 10 and 0 and he does have amateur fights it's kind of wild that he is as experienced as he is for how young of age that he is but this fight against candelaria will be really interesting because it's all going to come down to who can get on top of the other one if tatsulo can get on top i I do think his grappling is sound enough to where he's heavy enough, he can push Candelario down, and at least be positionally dominant enough to start winning minutes and rounds from the judges, but I do think Candelario will have an edge in some of the scrambles and any of the positions that aren't set like you had mentioned. I really do think he can find a leg, start to sweep. I don't think he's going to pull like a Claudio Poyas Clay Guida, because that was insane, but I do think that he will have the advantage when we aren't in those set positions, and let's say Tatsuro does go for one of those big takedowns, and he can't immediately establish that top position well those normally do create quite a bit of momentum from the trips and if there is a lot of momentum behind them Candelario might be able to position himself to end up on top in one of those exchanges and if that is the case he does have really good ground and pound and I do think that's sort of his X factor in this matchup I do think Tatsulo he's a little bit more going to hold you down and try to take the fight out of you as it goes on but Candelario is going to make you pay for every second you're under him he is hellacious with some of his ground and pound and I could see that being his best path to victory the weirdest part about it for Carlos Candelario, he competed on season one of Dana White's Contender Series in 2017. He was able to get a win as a plus 180 underdog against Ronaldo uh, Candido. So in that fight, he gets the win, but he tears up his knee. So from 2017 to about 2019, he's out because of the knee injury. Then he takes a fight and hurts his knee again. And then he's out for another extended period of time. He's 2-0 with CES against one tricky, tricky fighter in Miguel Restrepo. But the trouble is, in the fight before a contender series, then in his fight against Victor Altamirano, he tended to slow down a lot after putting out a high amount of work in his first round. So... For Candelario, when I watched that Altamirano fight, I thought that Victor was able to win round two, round three. Candelario handily won the first oh, round. Yeah. And I was very surprised, A, it was a split decision and how much Dana White disagreed with it to make Carlos Candelario the first ever person signed off a loss. Now, maybe it was because he felt bad that he tore his knee up and he was in the first season and now we're, what, four years later? But regardless, you look at Tatsuro Taira, you talk about it. When he's so dominant with his upper body, it's crazy to imagine that just back in 2019, Taito was fighting at strawweight. And then he fought at bantamweight. 
And then he fought at flyweight. So it really is weird because when you look at him in his fights, I, I can say this because I, I feel like we're both in the same boat of he has chicken legs. They're very skinny. They are. But his upper body's very strong. And Something I can't relate to. We talked about both of these guys with their striking. Obviously, I favor Candelario with the striking. When it's on the feet, he's a much better striker. He throws more volume. He throws with great power. For Taita, he tends to throw one single shot and then reset and take a little bit of time. He extends himself, drops his hand on this side, and then pulls it back. He's got really, really effective leg kicks. That's probably his best strike. He really plants on his lead leg, whips that kick out there, brings it back. He's very quick with that. But when I watch him just strike, it's almost like he's trying to think as he strikes, whereas he can flow with his grappling. And when he thinks when he strikes, he leaves his head up. And sometimes when he's on the defensive, and this is really plays well into Candelario's skill set, Candelario moves forward with pressure, throws a lot of power, tries to take you down. Tie it on the back foot, will block punches with his arms and leave his head up. And it's one of those things that it does scare me, especially in a fight against Candelario and as he moves forward. Now, the good thing about Tatsudo Taira, about 10 weeks ago, he makes a trip over from Japan to the States, training at Extreme Couture. And I want to make sure that I get this one right, Matt, because he also has fellow Shuto Bantamweight champ with him. And that is a great thing to have. So two buddies, they're over there. They're training in the States. They're getting ready for a fight like this. What I did was I took the characters of his name in Japanese, threw them into Google, translated it, read a bunch of Yahoo Japan articles about him, and they said that his coach is Ryota Matsure, who is uh, the Shuto junkie, so you like to see that one, and the best guy that he can train with, or that he's found training with at Extreme Tour is Amir Albazi, and oh yeah, it's Ryu Okada is who he went with, the Shuto Bantamweight champ, but... A guy like Amir al is pretty damn good to train with if you're getting ready for Candelario, wouldn't you say? I would agree, but the difference is Candelario is going to have, like, Rob Font to help him train. And I think that's a pretty big X factor, too, because although Rob Font might not train in that exact style, he is a much better fighter. So I, I do think that both guys do have a very good training situation set up around them, and that is a big key factor for this fight. Here's a weird wrinkle, though, and I'm curious to get your opinion on this. I think if Candelario wins the first round on his striking, he's going to win this fight because he doesn't actually have to expend that much energy to win the first round on the feet. He's not someone who will flurry as much as he'll throw some big, heavy single shots. And if he's able to do that and just win the first round, I don't really think he's going to have to expend as much energy. And then he might still have the chance to outgrapple in round two or three. The difference is, if he wins the first round with his grappling, I think it's going to have him much more spent in the second and third round and make him much more available to be taken down from Tatsugo as the fight progresses. So if we bring it on back, rope it on in, we have a look at the odds for this one. Taeda at a minus 240 favorite. You have Carlos Candelario on the comeback at a plus 190. And if we have a look over on topology for the total votes, Matt, I'll leave it open to interpretation. But I suspect that these are going to be the same as a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to say over under 75% Taeda. I'll say over. I'm going to say over. It is well over 470 total votes. You have 69% taking Taeda to win by submission. The 9% that have Candelario. 80% by decision. So Matt, again, I said last week with Taeda, the only thing is he has taken on a decent level of competition over in Japan. Very unorthodox takedown attempts from him. But there's some things that I definitely like out of Candelario. Definitely the better striker. Definitely the better offensive wrestler with his lower body attacks, especially in the first round. But as it goes on, second round, third round, he kind of wanes a little bit, and you like the activity out of Taeda. So for me, I'm going with Japan's Taeda, but this is, again, another one of those fights I keep off my card. For Tatsulo, I do worry a little bit that he got started too young. I do worry that maybe we will see his prime early. We might see his prime end a little bit early, but I don't think that's going to affect him in his UFC debut. That's just something to look forward to down the road, because I do agree. He does have a very high level of competition on his resume, and he's been having tough fights since a very, very young age, so I just worry he might have taken a little bit too much tread off the tires before he came to the UFC, but I still see him winning this weekend. Matt going with Japan. Eric Silva. I'm in agreement on this one. We have a big time fight coming up in the main event at light heavyweight. Jan Blahovic, the former champ, taking on Serbian Thunder. Alexander Rakic. You're not going to want to miss it. Let's keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. And we have a fight 
Spike coming up this weekend at Strawweight, and if it was a radio announcer that was really trying to get the crowd jazzed up, like especially in our small town of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, probably the Clash of Styles coming up. Vina Janjanova taking on Angela Hill. It's Overkill Hill who hasn't been overkilling anything. If anything, she's been undercooking it. She's one of four in her last five, and for Hill. I mean, some of these fights are really, really close. we got to admit that. Three of them are losses by split decision. One of them by unanimous. And the one win that she has is a really good one. I mean, for Hill, it just hasn't been representative of the fights that she's had lately. Even look at her last fight. She loses it by split decision to Amanda Lemos. All depends on how you consider that first round. I mean, to you, was it a 10-8? Did you think the knockdown did enough and all the control and everything that Lamos did in the first round of that fight? I thought it was. So did I. So if I look at it, then I have it as a draw. 10-8 Lamos, round two, round three, 10-9-4, Angela Hill. But regardless, it's a loss on Hill's record. She's got to pick up the pieces and take on another Invicta strawweight champ from the past. Both these women, former champs, and... For Janji Doba, it's been, I guess, a little bit more recent, and it's been a weird run for her in the UFC. I mean, she's 3-2 and two in the 5-on-in. In. You consider the two losses, 1-2 Mackenzie Dern, relatively close fight there. One loss to Amanda Hebos, where she kind of did the lay motion that one. Gets the knockdown in the first round, looks really good. Then lose the second round and loses the third round. And it's got to be kind of that Spider-Man meme when they see each other this week. Because Amanda Hebos has a fight coming up against Caitlin Chukagan. You consider Venus wins. Mallory Martin, big finish win there. A finish win over Felice Herrig. And a finish win over Kaneko Murata, Japan's submission ace. And finishing ace. And a very exciting fighter. But again, these two possess clashing styles if you will and a very surprising Janji Doba who has seemed to improve with her striking as this short UFC tenure has gone on. She does seem to have deceiving power in her hands and this is the weird thing and I'm going to be surprised to see what these fighters look like when they initially face off because they're both listed as five foot three. I... Angela Hill must be the tallest 5'3 ever, and Vina must just be the shortest 5'3 ever. I don't believe whoever took that stat. I just don't. I think Angela Hill is much bigger, and I'm very curious to see what they look like when they do face off. So that's going to be the first thing I have to say. Here's the thing with Angela Hill. You're right. A lot of her losses are close. But a lot of her wins are razor close too. She almost suffers from like Joanne Wood-itis, if you will, where it's like, okay, Angela, if you want to win a perfect fight, how do you want to do it? Her answer is probably like split decision. I'm just going to slightly outvolume my opponent and hopefully stay on the back foot. Fool those judges. It kind of is the case. And I know that it seems like I'm trying to sell you low on Angela Hill, but that just is the case. In some of her worst losses, there are really close, but some of her best wins are also very close. That has to be said. I just never really know where to gauge Angela Hill when she's fighting anybody, because if she's fighting someone with a lot of power, then okay. She's going to be at a disadvantage. You normally do see that in her fights. Then get on the inside. They'll make her pay a little bit more than what she can do to her opponent. But if she's fighting someone who doesn't have a ton of power, and for Vina, her striking has gotten better. She has dropped, I mean, she dropped uh, Amanda Hebos, which was very surprising to see. And she won by TKO in a prior fight to that. So you might think she does have big power. I'd say she might have a slightly more power in this matchup, but I don't think it's enough to just say, wow, if she gets on the inside of Angela Hill every single time, she's going to be able to win these exchanges because Angela Hill has deceiving elbows. She is one of these fighters who has realized, okay, I have long punches, so a lot of my opponents try to get on the inside of my punching range. She will uh, use elbows as a way to counter her opponents getting on the inside. I just worry if Angela Hill can get back up to her feet if Vina does get an offensive takedown in this fight because I think that's the one area that Vina is quite a bit stronger in than Angela Hill. Vina in her two losses in the UFC too. It is kind of unfortunate. Three. Three. She also has a loss to the champ, Carlos Sparza in Janji Doba's debut with the That's promotion. true. I forgot that that was so long ago. It's wild that she's been in the UFC for as long as she has been because it feels like she got called out from Invicta yesterday, but I guess it has been years at this point. But for Vina, she has lost to people who do what she does but they just sort of tick up the sliders a little bit. Like, Amanda Hebos does everything Vina does, but I'd say she's a slightly better grappler, especially with her slickness on the ground, and her cardio is a little bit better. And with Mackenzie Dern, her and Vina, they're very, very similar, but Vina's good at jujitsu, and Mackenzie Dern just so happens to be great at it. I just feel like for Vina, if she got matched up a little bit differently in the UFC, there's a version of her who's probably, like, borderline top five right now, if we're all being honest. It's just her losses have come to people who are at the top of the division, whereas for Angela Hill, I know her losses have been 
been close, but I do feel like she is starting to slow down a little bit in her career. She is 37 years old. She is 13 and 11. And again, her losses don't mean that much, if we're being completely honest. Like, the 13 and 11 is quite deceiving, but again, she hasn't been getting better with time, and I do feel like we are seeing her start to slow down at this stage. She did have a bit of a run when she came back, and it, not to say that it was surprising, but it really was nice to see, especially just kind of with the way things kind of left off with the UFC exactly. before she, got she went back. She completely written off, exactly. That's oh, a good 100%. Point. So I love to see that. The one stat that's very telling, again... Vina Janjidoba, very, very credentialed on the ground. You know how good her submissions are. You've seen them. The Fleece Herrig win won a performance bonus at UFC 252. It was a sub two-minute submission for Angela Hill. Fight of the Knights. There's been a three of them. One against Jessica Andrade. Did she win that fight? No, but it was a barn burner. Knocked her down. One against Michelle Watterson and the one against Amanda Lamosh back in December. And yeah, Hill got knocked down and then kind of held down by Lamosh, but rallied hot and heavy in the second and the third round. Really looked good. Picked up the offense. Really did start to find her groove in those last two. And if it was a five-round fight, who knows? But it wasn't. So when it does come down to the odds for this one, Vina opened a minus 140 favorite. She's minus 161 for Angela Hill. Opened a plus 120 at a plus 133 right now. If we have a look at the topology votes, they are surprised to us as they are to you. I'm going to say over under 65% for the Brazilian here. I think they'll be over. I think they're going to be over. Slightly under. 562 total votes. 64% Jan uh, what is it? 75% have her to win by decision for the 36% that have Hill. 87% by decision. And for Angela Hill... Very, very good takedown defense throughout her entire UFC tenure. It's at an 87% clip. Numbers on a page are fun to look at. So is the fact that her significant strikes landed per minute are 5.56. Tavina's 2.81, but it only takes one takedown to get rid of that number. So see how people can play the number game in their favor. I just did and then contradicted it so you people can see how Stats numbers... Stats make no sense in MMA, guys. Numbers don't make any sense. But I think when this fight takes place, Angela Hill decided advantage on the feet. Vina does have power, but it's kind of a little bit delayed. She can kind of put herself out there with some of those shots, and she's a little bit stiff. So I like Angela Hill to grind out a decision in this one, which is strange for me. Because normally I go with Vina and just about every single fight she's in. This is probably going to be a split decision no matter who wins. It's going to be the ground control of Vina versus the overall volume of Angela Hill. The frustrating thing about Hill is that she could win this fight based on her volume on the feet. Not a lot of her strikes land clean. And boy is it frustrating to watch. We're going to talk about Caitlin Chukagian later. And that's a whole other point. Sometimes judges can be misled by shots that land on like the arms and the hands in MMA especially. And I do feel like Angela Hill sometimes benefits from that. Not a lot of her shots do get through. Again, she, the wins are wins and the losses are losses. I I do feel like if Vina is able to get the takedown, she will be able to hold Angela Hill down. And that's why I'm going to pick Vina in this matchup. I do think that if she is able to secure those takedowns, it's a big if, don't get me wrong. I just think if she's able to get on top of Angela Hill, she might not be able to get the submission, but she'll at least be able to control her enough to start winning rounds. We're split on the pick. Matt going with Kakara, Vina, Janjidoba. I'm going with Overkill Hill. To kill it in the fight, I guess. I mean, listen, it's a nickname, it rhymes, and it's a big time fight in the strawweight division. We got a big time fight in the light heavyweight division in the main event. It is Alexander Rakic returning, taking on the former champ, Jan Blahovic. You're not going to want to miss it. So you're locked <laughs> in with sneeze night picks, as we always say. Let's, let's get, get into it. it. Coming up. This weekend, a sketchy fight between a couple of older fellas at the lightweight division. We have the menace, Michael Johnson. Dennis was a child and Michael is a man, and you got to get rid of the menace nickname. Going to be taking on New Get, a lot Patrick, a guy who never fights. And when he does, they're memorable, but sometimes for all the wrong reasons. I mean, for Patrick, you look at it, the five on in is very, very sporadic. So I'm just going to say this. He makes his UFC debut in 2013. If you've got a chalkboard at home, tack one on for the boys. He fights once in 2013, once in 2014, once in 2015, twice in 2016, no times in 2017, twice in 2018, and none in 2019, once in 2020, and once in 2021. This is his first fight of 2022. Alain Patrick is now too much shy of being 39, and he never fights in the UFC, but he's still 15-3 and with a no contest. His record's squeaky clean, and that's just strange to me. You know what's even stranger? The prolonged embrace he had with Charles Oliveira last weekend at UFC 274, when Oliveira went into the crowd, and then here comes this guy, 
oh, it's Alain Patrick. He's monster stealing the talent out of the ball. He just... And now Patrick's going to win this fight this weekend. If he does fight like Charles Oliveira, he will definitely beat this version of Michael Johnson, who... You want to talk about the sad decline. Like, Michael Johnson has not been the same fighter for a meaningful period of time now. And I don't think we're going to start sitting here and start telling people, hey, what? You want it already? Goodness gracious. No, no, send it over. Was I in the building for his last win? I was yes, there! Right. He beat Artem Lobo! And you've never talked about it once on this channel. But for a law Patrick, they sold so many wolf tickets when he fought Scott Holtzman. That's the only thing I ever think about when a law Patrick fights. The commentary is like, hey, he's been away for a while, he's back, he's great on the feet. Pretty good submissions on the mat, too. And then Scott Holtzman absolutely dusts him. Like, beats the brakes off him, pillar to post, boxes his ears in. And Alain Patrick's never really been the same fighter ever since then. And it's weird. He does move quite well on the feet for a guy who is a little bit advanced in age. He does have that sort of bot back and forth that we saw even, like, Carla Esparza have in her last title fight. Didn't think I'd be ever talking about that fight again. But Alain Patrick does move very well on the feet. The problem is, there's not really anything behind it. It is sort of like when Ezreal Adesanya fought Jan Blahovich, And the whole time, Joe Rogan's like, boy, those feints are some nice guys, aren't they? I really like that feint. He's talking about the feints, and feints are great, but you need something after the feints. A feint is to set up a strike afterwards, and for a La Patrick, he's doing a lot of really good movement on the feet, but he's not really setting anything up with his own movement, and to me, it's a lot of wasted movement, especially for a guy his age who does slow down as fights go on. He does stay very bouncy on his feet in that first round. But in the second round, a little bit more flat-footed. In the third round, a lot more flat-footed. And the strange thing is, when you're trying to break down a Michael Johnson fight at this stage of his career, again, not to harp on everybody at ESPN, but it's like every single morning radio show for, like, the NBA. It's, oh, is James Harden going to look like MVP James Harden? No. There's enough of a sample size now to where I strongly doubt he's going to go back six years and become the athlete he once was. Johnson still at times likes to throw his power punches, but again, the problem is there's not a lot of power behind them. He's not even getting knockdowns in a lot of these fights in this stage of his career, which is odd for a guy who is known for his blistering hand speed and incredible knockout power. Well, when we look at Michael Johnson, one of the things that I used to say all the time when he was winning fights was, man, I love the fact that Michael Johnson corners a lot of his teammates at Sanford MMA. When was the last time you saw Michael Johnson cornering anybody at Sanford MMA? It's been a meaningful amount of time. And you look at the fights that he's had. We'll just consider the five on end because, of course, it includes a win that sent Artem Lobov out of the UFC in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Lose to Josh Emmett in a fight where he was winning, what, two and a half Wait, rounds? Artem Lobov has won a fight more recently than Michael Johnson. He beat Pauli Malignaggi at BKFC. It happened. But you have Michael Johnson losing to Josh Emmett by knockout. Oh. Lost to Stevie Ray by majority decision. A lot of people thought Johnson won that fight. I'm me included. I'll, I'll put that out there. Lost to Thiago Moises, where he had a great first round, and then he got caught in the heel hook in the second round. Then he lost to Clay Guida. And it's not just that he lost to Clay Guida. I have the numbers from that one. All three judges scored at 30-27. Guida outmatched him on the feet and completely outwrestled him in that fight. So if I just look numbers on a page and I use my brain, the last time I saw a good Michael Johnson fight, or the amount of good Michael Johnson fights that I see are kind of like the amount of Black Horse beers that I find at the liquor store. Listen, it's Newfoundland's finest. It's my favorite beer. I never give it, but when I do get it, I get incredibly excited for it, just like I do for a Michael Johnson fight. And has he beaten Dustin Poirier? Has he beaten Edson Barboza? Has he beaten Tony Ferguson? Yes, 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 and yes. You can check all those boxes off in your bingo card. If you would like, get that dabber out. But when it comes to Michael Johnson, or when it comes to my sweet, sweet Black Horse from Newfoundland, it's just not all that often that I get what I want. And for Alain Patrick, you look at the big wins that he had, and we just talked about Stevie Ray, but if you consider them, the fight that he had against Damian Brown took him down five times in that fight. The fight against Stevie Ray, he had five takedown attempts. The fight against, or five takedowns landed. The fight against Demir Hadzavac, he took him down, I don't know why I said Hadzavac, like Hadzavac, but he took him down nine times in that fight. So if Patrick is rolling... He's not really good at holding guys down. He's very much submission over position, but he is a black belt on the mat. For Michael Johnson, poorest takedown defense over his entire UFC career. But again, blistering hand speed, very, very good with his volume. That's really the tale of the fight. Michael Johnson's the DeMarcus Cousins of the UFC. I'm sorry, but it's true. His peak was good. It was short, but it was pretty good. They got a lot out of him when he was good. 
But the decline's been going on for a while, and we only really brought up his last five. Like, I know he's one in four in his last five. It's been rough his last ten. Like, Michael Johnson has not had a sustained period of success and a really meaningful period of time. He beat Andre Feely and Artem Lobov to end a three-fight losing streak. To be fair, it was to Habib Nurmagomedov, Justin Gaethje. He looked terrible in Darren Elkins' fight in his initial fight down at 145. I thought he lost to Andre Feely. He beat Artem Lobov in what was a fairly close fight, to be completely honest. It was honest. awesome. And then he's lost four in a row. It's just been a very long time since Michael Johnson's been able to put together any form of success at the UFC level. I don't love that I'm picking a La Patrick in any UFC bout whatsoever, but I do think he's going to be able to beat Michael Johnson. Like, I, Johnson doesn't really even look like he has the desire to be at the UFC level anymore. He doesn't look like the same guy he used to be. Matt Allen going with the former Batetti Combat Champion. I never thought I would. A guy who has 444,000 Instagram followers. Alain Patrick. Patrick, the definition of big in Brazil. We have a look at the odds for this one. Patrick opened a plus 110 favorite roughly there. Michael Johnson at a minus 140, minus 135. Depending on the site, the over under on the topology is priced us. It is to you. I'm going to go way off the board and I bet you it's Johnson. over. I'm going to say 70% Michael Johnson. Probably because the name value. Look at that. 508 total votes, 75% Johnson, 74% by decision. For the 25% that have Alain Patrick, 74% by decision. Alain Patrick looked terrible against Mason so Jones. Bad. Who's so much bigger than him in his I'm... last fight. Mason Jones was on his way to win that fight, and then the eye poke ended it. And instead of giving it a DQ and a win for Alain Patrick, somehow it was a no contest. You're not supposed to put your finger in somebody's eye, especially if it ends the fight. But that's what we got out of that one. Patrick looked bad. He's old. He's almost 39. Michael Johnson, a couple weeks away from his 36th birthday. I have a lot Patrick in this fight. The confidence level, Doesn't I Doesn't feel good saying it, does it? Oh, it feels terrible. I think he's going to work the wrestling, work in his submissions. I think if it's a stand-up battle, Michael Johnson still has the volume to win a fight like this. But... Neither guy is going to be fighting for the title or ranked opponent anytime soon. Another fight that you watch with your pop and your popcorn, or you run to the store to grab more. Last other sport reference, Michael Joss is like Cody Bellinger. Like, at one point, it was great all across the board. Now people are like, hey, he's really good at defense. It's like, okay, that might be the case. Like Joey Gallo. Like, but Bellinger at least won MVP. Gallo only made one All-Star game. Like, Bellinger was great, and now he's only known for one very small part of his game. Michael Johnson was great. Now he's kind of known for his boxing, but his wrestling really hasn't been great at the USC level. Big time fight coming up this weekend at Lightweight. Both of us regretfully going already, I'm saying that. You're not wrong until Saturday night with Alain Patrick. Let us know down below in the comments section if we're absolutely buck wild. And we have a big time main event coming up at light heavyweight between Jan Blahovic and Alexander Rakic that you're not going to want to miss. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Top 10 flyweights looking to advance in the division. It's number eight, Viviani Araujo. The nickname is Vivi. You could get a little bit more creative. For Andrea Lee, her nickname rhymes with her name, but it's just not the time or the place. She's ninth ranked in the division. And on a two-fight finishing streak, and for Andrea Lee, I got a level with everybody out there with Fight Night Picks. I had to do my research for this fight, of course, but I don't often go back and watch our videos. And I did for this one specific reason. I didn't watch the entire video, I just watched the end. I picked every single Andrea Lee fight wrong on this channel. When she really? fought Lauren Murphy, I picked Lee. She lost that fight. When she fought Mata Ferry, I picked Lee. She lost that fight. When she fought Shevchenko, I picked Shevchenko. And when she fought Cynthia Calvillo, I thought that girl was nasty and I'm going to pick Cynthia Calvillo. I've been wrong in the last four fights going back about two and a half years. So I have no damn idea what Andrea Lee's going to do. Now, I know exactly what her technique is at this point in her last two fights have really shown this well-rounded game plan. I mean, we saw it against Shevchenko, dominated her on the mat, was able to get the finish. Her last time out there, she broke Cynthia Calvillo at 125 pounds. Like, broke her down, finished her TKO at the end of it. But really, really good showings out of Andrea Lee. I think she's really centered her camp and figured things out. Obviously, Tony Kelly, a big central part of that. But I want to give credit where credit's her due. Life. A lot of people over on the Instagrams, Andy Nguyen, you, you know her, you love her, the Crasian. You also have Tyler Schaefer, Combate's own, and Victoria Leonardo. 
UFC fighter as well. But for Lee, it's really been a very well-rounded skill set to a fighter who kind of came to know and love as a very good kickboxer. But I love what I've seen out of her, not just in these last two fights. I know there were a lot of close decisions, so on and so forth. But again, if we do just focus on those last two, I really, really like what I see or what I have seen out of Andrea Lee. She is starting to prove that you can teach an old dog new tricks. Not that Andrea Lee is ancient in this weight class by any means, but she was definitely a fighter that you thought was set in her style. And I couldn't agree with you anymore. I definitely looked at her as primarily a kickboxer. And hey, if Andrea Lee is going to win a fight, she's probably not going to take it down to the mat whatsoever. But she's definitely proven that wrong as of late. And I've really liked her style because she'll figure out, okay, I'm very well-rounded. I get it done on the feet. I get it done on the ground. My wrestling is ever improving. So she'll just take the fight to wherever her opponent feels the weakest. And that's a really great game gameplay like that works across the division no matter who you're fighting the weird thing about both of these fighters though is it's kind of like when you're breaking down any playoff team in any sport you look at the strengths you look at the weaknesses i feel like both these fighters have very obvious strengths but both of them have very obvious weaknesses too and that's why this fight should be a lot of fun for lee no power on the feet if we're being honest good pitter patter she can start to accumulate damage if her jab is landing a lot but that really is the key to a lot of her damaging shots but good volume on the feet normally is the key for angela lee and really good footwork too especially andrea andrea sorry especially while moving on the back foot. For Amarujao, she has very deceiving power, and it's odd because when it lands, it lands with hammers. But she doesn't really throw enough volume for her to always land those power shots, and it's kind of frustrating watching her fight sometimes because she has that build-up almost like Darren Till where it's like the... Like Hulk Hogan. Yeah, you're building for something, but then we never get the leg drop out of her. We just kind of see those feints. We see that upper body movement. But she can get outworked in her fights. And I always go back to the Jessica I fight. Trust me. Everybody knows my thoughts on Jessica I and her fighting for a title. And her in the top of really any division. She did beat Arugia, though, just by being busier in that fight. And it was a close fight, don't get me wrong, but I thought Jessica I left as the winner just really by throwing one-twos, and they didn't all land. It was just by being active that was able to do enough for Arugia, who I feel like if she was able to use her athleticism a little bit more, be it in the clinch or even with her own takedowns, I think she'd have a lot more success because she is one of the bigger fighters in this weight division, especially fighting Andrea Lee, who I wouldn't say is big for 125 whatsoever. She's kind of thin for the division. I think if Arugia can get this into the clinch she could have a lot of success just with her physicality so viviani arugia if she's not getting wins by finish it's kind of the we talk about blueprints she wins the first round loses the second round wins the third round and that's how she's going to win a decision but her last time out against caitlin chukagi and she lost the first round won the second round lost the third round so it was a complete about face for arugia and everything i knew i mean again you talked about the fight that she did have her second to last loss was that one against a really tough fighter in jessica I, but I look at the fight that she had against Alexis Davis where she looked really good in the first round second round Davis is wearing on her and then Arujao had to pick it up in the third and you thought wow you know heavily muscled at 125 it was the first chink in the armor that you saw in her UFC yeah, career but third round she was able to rally in that one and I like that out of her and she's somebody that trains out of Serato MMA a gym that's synonymous with Vicente Luque but also you have Gilbert Burns his old stomping grounds there you really do like again for our 94% takedown defense in the UFC the only person to take her down was Montana De La Rosa for a very small amount of time the other flip side of that coin is the fact that for Andrea Lee if Cynthia Calvillo was going to beat her, she was going to grind on her, take her down, wear on her. Calvillo went one of three in takedown attempts in that fight and got 39 seconds of control time total. Can Andrea I, Lee did a great job in that one. I, it, I, I want to get your opinion, though, on that fight because there is a part of me that just feels like Cynthia Calvillo was not ready for that whatsoever. So I just don't know how much stock to put into it because you're right. Calvillo did have that one sort of burst for the takedown, had a little bit of control time, but it felt like the second the fight got back up to the feet, she was just sort of broken from that point on. So I, personally, I don't know how much stock I can put into that win because it just felt like Andrea Lee was going to beat Calvillo no matter what. Like Calvillo didn't look like herself whatsoever is what I'm trying to say. I mean, to kind of gain from a Beastie Boys reference, Andrea Lee looked as cool as a cucumber in a bowl of hot sauce she did. in that one. So a big time win for her. But for Arujo, you can't forget the wins that she does have in the UFC. You brought it up. I mean, that big win over Toledo Bernardo years ago. Big knockout win. She also beat Alexis Davis. The two wins sandwiched between the losses, Montana Del Rosa and Roxanne Modafferi. Happy trails in retirement. We have a look at the odds for this one. Arujao opened a minus one, or sorry, a plus 125 favorite. She is a minus 104 as a slight underdog. Andrea Lee opening up minus 145, minus 118 as it stands right now. Now, 
This could be one of those fights like Lupe Godinez taking on uh, big time Ariane Carnelosi. Carnelosi's coming off of two big finish wins. And then in my eyes, she got 30 24. But listen, hey, it is what it is. Arujo could come back out, get a big win here. But when we look at the fan votes, Matt on Tapology, surprise us, it is to you. I'm going to say over under 65% Lee. I think Arujo will be the favorite. I think Arujo, no, slightly Lee, 585 total votes, 69% Lee, 89% by decision. For the 31% that have Arujo, 88% by decision. Matt, when Viviani Arujo debuted in the UFC, I thought she was going to be top five for a really long okay. time. We're not quite there yet. For Andrea Lee, I thought about the same. Former LFA champ at flyweight. Who was the champ after at flyweight with the LFA, you ask? Sabina Mazow. Sabina Mazow recently wow. released. Andrea Lee's still doing the damn thing. Let's pick here. It is a hard fight to pick. Again, I can see Andrea Lee looking really good until she doesn't. And then maybe she does give up an inopportune takedown near the end of a round that could seal it for Arusha. Or maybe Arusha looks really good in the clinch in some opportunities and can land big power shots. Because that's the thing about Lee. She is good at distance, but when fighters get on the inside of her, Joanne at the time, Calderwood now, Joanne Wood, had a lot of success with her elbows on the inside against Lee. And that really told the story of that fight. So I'm a little worried about Angela Lee in some spots on the feet, but I do feel like her volume is going to be quite overwhelming in this matchup and the thing about her grappling is it's not great by any means but I do think it's tricky enough to where if it is on the mat she can get back up to her feet or she can threaten enough with her own submissions in her own top game to secure minutes and moments in the fight so I'm picking Andrea Lee but it's wild what two years will do because two years ago I agree with you I thought Araujo would definitely beat someone like Andrea Lee but given the improvements Lee has been able to make throughout her UFC tenure and the fact that Araujo kind of looks like the same fighter that she was when she initially came into the UFC FC is going to make me pick Andrea Lee. Matt doing the cha-cha slide with Angela Andrea Lee. I'm in agreement on the pick. I think the volume will be the difference maker. Arujo, will she go for the takedowns? Will she implement some of the grappling that we have seen a little bit in the past? I don't think so. And again, the big power shot could be there, but I do like the volume of Lee in this fight. So both of us going with Andrea Lee out of Louisiana to get the win. You let us know down below in the comments section who you have. Some big time fights on this card that remains. Keep it locked in with Fight and Apex. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Coming up this weekend, a very exciting fight in one of the most dynamic divisions. And you always need new fighters because flyweight never die. We have an awful nickname, former EFC and Cage Warriors champion, White Kong. Jake Hadley, it hits like a train, and I don't necessarily like it. Taking on Puro Oso, Alana Cemento, and when I look at this fight, these two guys can do one thing very, very well. It's grapple till the cows come home. And for Jake Hadley, he's definitely made that a hallmark of his game. And you look at it, I mean, he was a young, young man. Well, he still is right now. He's 25, almost 26. But you look at it, I mean, he's taking fights. And I want to make sure I give credit where it's due. With golden ticket fight promotions, he beat an 0-24 Reese Street. Reese Street. Finished him in the first round. You know what EFC did? They went with their rotary phone. They called him up and they said, Hey, Jake and Jake's representatives. You want to take a fight down here with EFC? We're, we're going to give him a title shot. It's against a pretty damn good fighter. And they went, yeah, let's do it. And then he wins that fight. Kind of wild. And it's like, oh, so we're off to the races right now. So Jake Hadley, since debuting as a pro in 2018 to now, he is 8-0. He was also 7-2 as an amateur from 2014 to 2017. And listen, level of competition is really weird. Over with Cage Warriors, with Bellator, that's when it started to get better. Fighting Blaine O'Driscoll is a big feather in your cap. I really love to see that. Beat him by submission. It was a rear naked choke about two and a half years ago. Then he goes out and he takes on Shajul Heck. And in that fight, he gets the big win. So then he takes on Luke Shanks. And listen, Luke Shanks, with the, one of the first right hands he throws, wobbles Jake Hadley. Bad. And then after that, Jake Hadley beats him. And I want to make sure I read you the scores out of that Cage Warriors title fight. The judges score the contest 50-42, 50-45, and 50-44. Your winner by decision, Jake Hadley. 50-42? That doesn't happen. Like, Jake Hadley, after he got rocked, he went, I'm a wrestler. I'm going to wrestle the whole fight long. And he did a great job of that. We know exactly what he does. Comes out of Birmingham, fearless MMA. The guys he trains with that I've seen in the pictures are so much bigger than him, it's not even funny. Dominique Wooding, Fabian Edwards, Yannick Bahati, who I'm going to talk about later on in the show if you didn't think you were going to get a Yannick Bahati reference. That's number one. 
I've got one for the main event. Leon Edwards, of course, but again, a hallmark of his game is his wrestling and his grappling. Very, very good with his submissions. Striking, not his forte, and I know I'm going to talk about that more. I'm sure you will, but... I really like the signing, and I'm really excited about him in the UFC. His back-taking ability is very high level, and that's one of the first things that does stand out. I almost kind of compare his style to, like, a Kevin Lee, because Kevin Lee was always marketed as, he's like an Usman, he's like a Covington. In reality, he wasn't, though. Like, yes, they're all wrestlers, per se, but Usman's gonna get on top of you, control you, try to beat you up with some ground and pound. Kevin Lee never really fought like that. I know he did against Edson Barbosa, but what does Kevin Lee normally do when you think about Kevin Lee? Gets on top of you and immediately tries to take the back and go for a submission. Jake Hadley, in large part, fights in that manner. Now, when he gets the back, he is very tough to get off. And I kind of go to when Brandon Moreno fought Sergio Pettis. Where Sergio Pettis on the feet was faster. That was earlier on in Brandon Moreno's career. But when Moreno would get onto his back, it was one position that he couldn't do anything with. Another example, even a little bit more recently, was Aljamain Sterling, Piotr Jan. That position is like a checkmate, basically. It's a position that a ref's never going to get you out of, and it's a borderline 10-8 if you can hold it for more than two and a half minutes. And Jake Hadley has gotten very good at not only gaining that position, holding that position, and threatening submissions with that position. And I do feel like the rear naked choke probably is the best tool in his arsenal. He will complete it in every fight. He does have a number of wins by RNC on his record, but it is something that you can tell he likes to work towards in a lot of his matchups. And we were joking before the camera went on about Alain Nascimento. How strange is this guy's career, though? Like, he's only fought great fighters from his debut on, pretty much. He's fought in multiple different organizations, but fought great fighters from the whole entire time. In his mind, he's probably jumping from one organization to the other, thinking, okay, there's no way I'm going to keep on fighting guys who are 10-3, and 16-4, and 4. but... No, Alain Nascimento only finds himself so, fighting other world-class fighters so in the regional scene. The losses for Nascimento back in 2013, he's 7-0, taking on 11-4, Will Campisano, lose that one by decision, lose to Ricardo Hamos, who, again, was 2-0 at the time in 2013, but he's a pretty you damn good fighter. Is. Lose to Bruno Azevedo, who's on a lot of people's records. Lose to Yuki Matoya over with Ryzen, a damn good fighter over there. Colleen Pivan, one of the best fights on Dana White's Contender Series. Great. Back on Dana White's Contender Series Brazil in 2018. He beats El Zivado Lima back with uh, Puno de Aso uh, 6. Yeah, that's how it's pronounced. And he wins that one by rear naked. Then they give him a shot against Tagiru Lombekov. Loses that fight by split, but listen... The book's out on Tagir. He's going to wrestle you and not do anything else. And for Alain Nascimento, very, very accredited with his jiu-jitsu and one of the biggest 125ers you're ever going to see in your life. Dude. I'll throw it up there on Instagram, a couple of pictures of him, but he trains at Shoot the Box with Thomas Almeida, with uh, a guy who's also on this card, Alain Patrick. And Nascimento looks to be the same size as those guys. I don't know how he makes 125. And listen, that's really the story of this fight. Jake Hadley missed weight on Contender Series. This was the quotable from the promo pack on Dana White's Contender Series. Jake Hadley on his opponent, Mitch Raposo. I feel like Mitch is a good fighter, and I'll be a challenge, but you know, it's a bit disrespectful that he's fighting me, in a way, because he hasn't achieved anything. And then he goes out there, and Mitch Raposo beats him in the first round. Takes him down with ease, outstrikes him in the second round. Raposo's outstriking him. Jake Hadley goes for a takedown, just like Raposo done in the first and he gets it, and then Raposo can't get back up to his feet. That's the end of the fight. Great finish for Hadley. And then, of course, Dana White, the, you know, this is one that had taken so much to the back. You know, Shelby, McMaynard, they didn't want me to sign him. They didn't want me to sign him. I'm going to sign him anyway. Causes issues in the back. Like, it was so awkward when they signed Jake Hadley. It was really weird, but he is a good talent, and that's the thing. It is unfortunate that there is so much static and noise around his debut, because I do feel like he could be a very exciting prospect in this division, and he's only 25 years old, so I do feel like there is a very good foundation for him to continue to build on, especially if he's able to beat Nascimento, who, like you said, has a very good base in Jiu-Jitsu, but he's a fighter who you feel like can get out grappled in a lot of his fights. Yeah. I know that's a weird thing to say about someone who does have a black belt in BJJ, but he's almost slow with his Jiu-Jitsu, and that's what I do think is going to bite him in this weight class and you might be right that is a good point he is big for this weight class so I do wonder if he is starting to realize maybe I'm cutting too much weight to where it is affecting my gas tank it is affecting my reaction time at some point because I don't feel like Nascimento has a great gas tank at this weight class I don't feel like he's someone who's gonna be the same guy in that first minute and a half as he is in the last minute and a half and if Jake Hadley can get a few minutes of control time especially early on in this fight I think he'll, he will be able to 
coast to either a decision victory or be able to get a lot of ground control time. Whereas Nascimento, I feel like will fade as the fight continues. This fight was booked back in March. Hadley out due to an injury. And for Nascimento, you look at that fight. Even the fighting is Hadley and Pive. A lot of back and forth. I thought Nascimento won the first round. The second round... But definitely not the third round. And maybe that's where Jake Hadley, again, can capitalize in this one. You look at it for Nascimento. He has a background in Muay Thai as well. Really good to the leg and to the body with his kicks. Jake Hadley, another southpaw. Leads heavy on that lead leg. Really heavy. Doesn't tend to check his leg kicks. And both of these guys like to walk their opponents down quite a bit. I know Laura Sanko on the Contender Series said, you know, Jake Hadley's a bully, so on and so forth. With his fighting style, Hadley open to minus 300 favorite, minus 210 right now. Nascimento open to plus 250, plus 170. If we have a look at the votes on Tapology, I'm going to say over under 75% White Kong. White Kong. I'll say under. I'm going to say under. It's over 559 total votes. 86% Hadley. 77% by decision. For the 14% that I have at Nascimento, 68% by decision. I think Alain Nascimento is going to win this fight by decision. He is a decidedly better striker when it comes to this matchup. Can Hadley take this one down to the mat? We're going to see. I'm going to enjoy it. And for Nascimento... Can't have that Melissa Gatto. I'm going to play jiu-jitsu off of my back game plan, which we could see in this fight. Hadley, of course, could take the role of Cortez in that. But for me, I do like what I've seen out of Nascimento. No easy fight, so to speak. And I like him in this matchup, especially as an underdog. You kind of took the air out of my sails. I was going to bring up the Gatto fight right now. I do think Nascimento is going to be a little bit too happy to grapple with Jake Hadley in this matchup. I agree with you. On the feet, I definitely think he is the better fighter. But I do think he's going to be a little bit too happy to test his own grappling against someone like Jake Hadley and I do not think this is the fight to do that in so I am ever so slightly going to favor Jake Hadley even though I don't like where the odds are in this fight but just for prediction's sake I do like Jake Hadley. Jake Hadley training with Yannick Bahati it doesn't even make sense it makes zero sense but that's what he's doing getting ready for this fight it should be a good one split on the pick Matt going with the former EFC and Cage Warriors champ Hadley I'm going with the dog Alan Nascimento out of shoot the box Diego Lima with the champ Charles Oliveira and the guy Alain Patrick. It should be a great fight. Really looking forward to our main card and the main event. Jan Blavich taking on Alexander Rakic. You're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight Night Pips. And as we always say, let's get into it. It's finally time for the long-awaited return of the crank. Do you think that Frank Camacho in 2006 was completely compelled by the movie where Jason Statham just shoots his ramrod into that lady out in the street? You think he was all over that? You think that, you know what? That guy's a cool guy. I better take that as my nickname. Hey, Craig. I think Frank Camacho is all about that movie. Listen, it, it was an interesting movie. So interesting that they went, you know what? We need two of them. Jason Statham can do no wrong. Let's let him lead a franchise with The Rock, too. Let's do that. Those Fast Hobbs and Furious. Shaw. Come on, Craig. Those Fast and Furious movies. They get me going. Well, Frank Camacho is going to be taking on the UFC newcomer El Loco Manuel Torres, representing an interesting gym in Entram Gym. And for Manuel Torres, a very, very fun fighter, a very, very fit physical specimen. He looks like the guy that you see running CrossFit in any local city to you. You pick it. It could be Dubuque, Iowa. It could be Fredericton, New Brunswick. It could be the middle of absolutely nowhere in Alberta. Manuel Torres built like that guy who does way too much CrossFit. And the craziest part about it is he's jacked and he's lean at 155. This guy's a former champ in two different organizations of featherweight. I don't know how the hell he made it. I have no idea. But a very, very interesting fighter because mainly known for his wildness until he fights in Dana White's Contender Series and he turns the wildness down, turns the technique to a 10, and looks like an absolute world beater when he's taking on one Mr. Colton Englund. Colton Englund. And in that fight, Englund's the favorite. Manuel Torres goes out there, pumps a really good jab. They're in the clinch. Looks like a bit of a push down. And then Englund grabs his eye and Herb Dean goes, well, it is what it is. What are we worried about? Englund's completely blocking his face. The fight isn't stopped. Torres runs in there, bang, bang. Got Englund you. falls down, bang, bang. And the fight's over and Herb Dean goes, okay, I've had enough. So I thought it was an awful stoppage, but it is an awful sequence. Then it ends up as a stoppage, but Dana White was all about it. We've got a, a real guy with a killer instinct. We're going to sign him. And the package that I've seen out of Manuel Torres, all things considered, very impressive. I have one thing that scares me a little bit, Matt, and it's the fact that out of all of his fights, 13 of 14 of them had finished in the first round. 
A little bit scary. Those include his losses and also 11 of his 12 wins are by finish. All in the first round. He's won one decision. It was by split decision a number of years ago. I agree with everything you just said. But none of that can be more concerning than the fact that I think Frank Camacho is way better at grappling than he is at striking. Yet he only chooses to strike in every single one of his fights. Even though he hasn't proven to be the most durable guy as of late. Now, Frank Camacho at one point could eat absolute shots to the head that you would not believe. But the problem is... When you're known as a guy who gets involved into a lot of fight of the nights, you get hit a lot in the head. And the problem is in MMA, in not comparison to other sports, is that you do start to wear down just from doing that sport. In basketball, you can play 17 years and still be pretty much fine after it. Your feet and knees might be messed up, but for the most part, you'll be okay. Every time Frank Camacho gets into a fight of the night, he is, this is going to sound dramatic, but it is a part of the sport. Like, he's leaving a little bit of himself in there every time. And a little bit of himself is that durability that he's known for. And the crank does kind of speak to his craziness and his style. He goes in there looking to throw hammers with pretty much everybody. But he's not a pure striker by any means. And that really is the thing about Frank Camacho. He has good power in his hands. Without a doubt, he does. He has decent boxing, too. But he's not much of a kicker. He does need to get into a very specific range to get off a lot of his own attacks. And again... He's a good grappler. We just never really see that side of him. And that's always been the concerning thing about Frank Camacho. He doesn't know what he's good at in the sport of MMA. And that's what I'm concerned about him against a guy like Manuel Torres. And if Camacho got him to the ground, I think he could threaten him with guillotines. I think he could hold him down from half guard. I think he'd do a lot of good work. The problem is, is that Frank Camacho doesn't fight like that in MMA whatsoever. So I'm not really expecting him to all of a sudden put on the wrestling shoes. So for Camacho, I get it. He's 2-5 and five in the UFC. His first fights, the first three rather, joining the promotion. They were all fight of the night bonus winners. You look at some of the losses. One to Jeff Neal where he gets finished at 170. That was disgusting. And one to Benil Dariush at 155. And then he welcomes Justin Janes into the UFC. Camacho's a favorite. Janes finishes him. And then Janes fights four times and loses all four fights. And it's been since that Justin Janes fights that we or fight that we've seen Frank Camacho in the OC. He missed the entire Justin Janes era. Now, for Camacho. A glorious one it was. I listened to an interview he did with uh, the MMA report and with Jason Floyd. And he kind of touched on the fact that the long layoff, the car accident that he had in 2021, a couple of, and I want to make sure that I get this one right, a couple of herniated discs and he separated his shoulder. That was June of last year. But about two years of recovery. Definitely a good thing for the Dome. And the crazy spread about it is Frank Camacho is only a few days days away from his 33rd birthday like it feels like he's been around forever i know he debuted what back in 2017 with ufc but it feels like we've known frank camacho forever so coming into this fight yes frank camacho definitely has the big names on his resume again again you talked about the guillotine maybe there's some opportunities there for camacho for manuel torres you go back you watch it he took on a poorest level competition 10 and 11 carlos enrique cañada whose last name, if you didn't have the, the squiggle over the end, would be Canada. That's just crazy to see. But with UWC, runs across the cage, grabs him in a guillotine, and just yanks on it. One of the right most up. meathead finishes I've ever seen while researching a fighter. And when we're talking about CrossFit, you look at the damn <laughs> muscles on display. But if he doesn't get that... Like when it, Carlos yeah. Newton choked out Pat Militic, and you could see like every fiber of the muscles in his arm, that's what it looked like. Yeah, Carlos Newton, a part of the display that you can't really see all that well. But... When I do look at the odds for this one, Camacho open a plus 190 favorite, plus 125 right now for, or sorry, got to get that right. Plus 190 underdog, now at a plus 125, still an underdog. For Torres, open a minus 225, he's a minus 150. We have a look at the topology vote, surprise to us there to you. I'm going to say over and under 60% Camacho. I think Torres will be the favorite. Torres is a big favorite with fans, 85% going Torres, 66% by knockout. You got 15% going Camacho, 46% by decision, 39% by knockout. Matt, the pick here is weird because Frank Camacho's last win was Nick Hine, the sergeant. It's been a while since he's fought as well. But Manuel Torres, at the lowest of lows in terms of that competition level that Frank Camacho's faced in the UFC. So it's going to be interesting to see what we get out of both these guys, especially with Camacho's long layoff. Is Torres that much worse than Justin James, though? Probably not. Totally different fighters. I know they're totally different fighters. I'm just saying, both guys have big power on the feet and can take advantage of someone who has big holes in their striking. That's why I like Manuel Torres in this fight. Again, stylistically, maybe not every guy in his UFC debut would match up for a win for him because there are some holes in his game. But this matchup against Frank Camacho, 
you're fighting a guy who doesn't have a striking background, who is going to make this a striking matchup. And for Torres, he has great power with his kicks and with his punches, and he's very rangy for this weight class, so you're going to see Camacho crashing a lot throughout this fight. And if he's the one meeting the power or the punching power of Torres, he's probably going to go down sooner rather than later. If this gets into a second round, again, I'm starting to favor Camacho. 13 of 14 of Manuel Torres' fights have ended in the first round, and you look at it for Camacho, training to Team Oyama, Colin Oyama coached Carlos Esparza to a second strawweight title. That happened in real Dang. life. So listen, I'm going with Manuel Torres as well. Love the jab, love the right hand, like the submissions. I don't love the durability of Camacho, but we haven't seen him in two years, so I'm eager to see this fight. Both of us going with the debuting Mexican fighter that is El Loco, Manuel Torres. Let us know down below in the comments section who you have and a big-time main card remaining, so you're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's get into it. Coming up this weekend, it's the return to flyweight for Amanda Heba since she was a minus 700 favorite and beat Paige Van Zandt, sent her to BKFC, and that was way back, way back when. And listen, if you do look at it for Amanda Hebos, she has kind of jumped and juggled between the two divisions, fought a good level of competition outside of the UFC, obviously fought a decent level of competition inside of the UFC, and her last time out, she beat a fellow fighter who's on this card at strawweight in the former Invicta strawweight champ, Vina Janjadoba. So, for he boss the five on in, very, very good at four and one. A win over Mackenzie Dern, one over Randa Marcos, one over Paige Van Zant. The loss to Marina Rodriguez, she got finished in that fight, if you will remember. And then, of course, the win over Janji Doba. For Kaylin Chukagian, the five on in, incredibly good at this weight class of 125. The win over Antonina Shevchenko, got her fight against Jess Kondraj, where she lost. Then she picks up big wins over Cynthia Calvillo, that girl is nasty, Viviani Araujo, and Jennifer Maya in the rematch where it was pretty much the same thing as the first time they fought. Oh, Caitlin Chukagian. So Matt, I look at this fight and I, I could spend 30 seconds on this one, burn the page and go to the next one. But I do look at this one as Caitlin Chukagian, number one contender in this division. She's guarding everybody from fighting Valentina Shevchenko. I... I disagree a little. I still think Jessica Andrade is ahead of her in the whole grand scheme of things. Like, Andrade has the same key wins as she does at this weight class, and she knocked out Chukagin in under a round. Ooh, I agree with you. No, you're right. Chukagin is in one of those weird spots where you're almost like the Alexander Gustafson at 205, where it's, hey, you're really, really good. We all think you're great, but you're not as good as Wait. DC, and you're not as good as John Jones. But you're better than everybody else. Do you think Shevchenko pays to have that moat around her house that is Caitlyn Chukagian? She has kind of become sort of a safeguard for the champion to where Caitlyn Chukagian knows that, okay, if I can defend a few more, maybe Valentina will gift me another shot of the title. We all probably know how that's going to go if that does happen again. But let's not worry about that bridge until we cross it. This should be a really fun fight for Chukagian. Because, like you said, she's in a weird spot in the division. To where she could probably get a title shot if there isn't anyone with a lot of hype behind them in the division. Chukagian is always someone you could throw in there. Because she does have wins over a lot of the key names in the division. But Heba should offer her a very unique challenge. Because we all know Chukagian. What's she good at? Ha ha, move, ha ha, move. She's really good at striking on her back foot. She has great movement in the cage, but something that he boss has, and I do think it's a little underrated. She's a very good striker offensively with her own movement. She just moved forward with her kicks very well, and I think that's going to be a really important part to this game, because if she is chasing Chukagin a lot, most fighters can't catch Chukagin with their hands because she's using her feet to get away. He boss on the other hand, should be able to use her legs offensively to maybe cut down on the legs of Chukagin, hit the body some, Slow down some of the feet and some of the cardio that Caitlyn has, and maybe it'll make this fight a lot better as it goes on, because if Caitlyn's able to just stay on her bike and move backwards, it's going to be a really hard night for Amanda Hebos. I don't think she really has the power to hurt Caitlyn with that one big shot like uh, Jessica Andrade does, but on the other hand, I do think Hebos has some of the tools that can stay consistent throughout this fight to where... If Caitlyn does start to slow down, maybe Heboss can make it a very competitive third round. We know how good Heboss is with her grappling, with her jiu-jitsu, her plotting forward style, the ability to cut off the cage against her opponents, mixing it up head and body, pumping that jab out there, slipping out of the way of some of the bigger shots, and landing her big right hand. We've seen all of these tools in the past. And for Caitlyn Chukagin, good movement on the feet, steady. The most steady fighter that there's ever been, especially in this division. And again, for Chukagin, 
Former CFFC great. I mean, former title holder over there. We look at the odds for this fight. Former Bantamweight, too. Sorry, if I can. Like, a man if he bus can fight at strawweight, has fought at strawweight, should probably be a strawweight. Kaylin Chukagian beat Arena Aldana at 135 at UFC 205. I do expect quite a big size discrepancy between these two fighters. And I do expect Kaylin Chukagian to at least be the bigger fighter frame-wise and quite significantly. Chukagian opened to minus 175. She's now minus 170. So a slight movement there. He bus open a plus 150 or sorry a plus 130 she's a plus 135 as it stands we have a look at the top all votes surprise to us there to you manda he boss has a lot more instagram followers uh but oh to that i'm gonna say over or under 70 percent uk again i'll say over i'm gonna say over slightly over 607 total votes 72 percent uk again 92 by decision for the 28 percent that have he boss 70 by decision 19 percent by submission I think uh, just like Letter Kenny in Canada, it's a pitter patter. Let's get out or Caitlin Chikagian wins a decision. Unless you do have fight ending ability, and I mean like genuine fight ending ability, which and he boss has it, but I don't think she like other than Jessica and Valentina, not a lot of fighters in this weight class do. Not a lot of fighters that was in this weight class can finish you on the feet or on the ground in a multitude of different ways. Like he boss can finish you, but it has to be in some very specific scenarios where you're a little tired. She can isolate an arm on the ground. Caitlin, I think, is a very intelligent fighter, and she can fight off the back foot foot. And the other thing I will say. Chukagian was always known as a volume striker. The wrinkle she's added into her game post-Valentina title shot has definitely been her own offensive grappling. So I wouldn't even be surprised if we even saw a Chukagian offensive takedown just to change the look of this fight at, at any point, really. That Antonina Shevchenko fight melted my mind for Caitlin Chukagian. It was wild. We're going with the moat. We're going with the blonde fighter. Caitlin Chukagian to get the win. You let us know down below in the comments section who you have. Is it Brazil's Amanda Hebosh training back at home? Academia he boss or do you have New Jersey's own Pennsylvania's own it's Caitlin Chukagian with one of those aggressive entrance songs of all time in a big time opportunity to hear some DMX so keep it locked in with fight and apex and as we always say let's, let's get, get into it, it. Coming up this weekend, David Grant loses to Adrian Yanez in a questionable split decision. Louis Smolka loses to Vince Morales by first round TKO. And the loser of this fight goes home. All right, so realistically, we're looking at a fight that's very strange because for Davy Grant, long periods of inactivity, comes off of the long periods of inactivity, starts to finish guys at 135, then he fights Marlon Vera in a very good fight, then he fights Adrian Yanez in a fight where, okay, it's a split decision, but it was ridiculous. Two of the judges, Eric Clone and Junichiro Camillo, scored 29-28 for Adrian Yanez. They scored round one and round three for him. And Judge Tony Weeks decided, you know what? I know I'm in that picture with all the blood on me, but I'm going to score this one 30-27 Davy Grant just to make things spicy. That fight was not a 30-27 Davy Grant fight at all. MMA decisions, all 12 people that scored it, they all scored it for Yanez. It was very, very weird. It was a fun fight regardless. And for Louis Smolka, we started, if you watch the intro to these full card videos, we start them by talking about things that are pertinent to the fights. And for Smolka... An interesting run. He had a, what, a main event against Patty Holohan in Ireland at one point. But the first run in the UFC, while it was memorable, wasn't the best. Goes outside of the promotion. Starts fighting a man weight, winning fights. Comes back in, beats some energy. And it's been so-so since. I know he's 2-3 and three in his last five. That loss to Vince Morales kind of opened people's eyes. Because Vince Morales, tough. not a giant power puncher. Louis Smolka, never been knocked out in his UFC or in his overall MMA career. Has been dropped, though, on numerous occasions, to be fair. But there's times for firsts, and that was one. And for Smolka, that fight against Vince Morales, we're starting to go back about five months ago. So, Matt, I love love this matchup i think it's gonna be a really fun fight but this is a must win fight for these two guys without a doubt but they are in different stages of their careers for david green he was having a weird resurgence like he was a grappler won a lot by submission had a bit of a karate background but we definitely did not see all of his striking and then he started knocking people out with really nice boxing combinations, too. And I do like the unique style of David Grant. There's not a lot of people who fight like David Grant, to be fair. He's one of those fighters who just sort of falls into his own category. Like, you couldn't drop the David Grant square into anything else on that game where all the yellow ones would pop up. Was it uh-oh? I don't know. I think it was uh-oh. Yeah, the timer? Come on. 
Anyways, for David Grimm, other than Father Time catching up to him, I don't really know what Louis Smolka does better than David Grant in any one area of martial arts. I know he's the superior offensive grappler in some areas, but if we do just break down both guys style for style, well, with Jiu-Jitsu, David Grant's not one to get controlled very often. He's very good at getting back up to his feet. He can sweep and get back into an offensive position. He is very sound with his own defensive grappling. Whereas Louis Smolka, he's one of these peaks and valley grapplers where he'll look really good in some opportunities and then he'll look really poor in some other positions. On the feet, though, I, I agree 100% with what you brought up. Vince Morales is a good fighter, but not known as a power puncher whatsoever. And he was able to flatline Louis Smolka in their matchup. I do feel like we are starting to see some of the defensive liabilities of Louis Smolko rear their head a little bit. Like I said, he was someone who has been dropped in the past. I always go back to the Mateusz Nikolau fight. I know Nikolau, that happened a little while ago, but Nikolau dropped him three or four times in that matchup. Like, it was almost concerning by the end of it where you were like, hey, we could stop this at any moment. So I am kind of worried about, are we certain to see uh, Louis Smolka slow down? And are we certain to see his durability get chipped away at? Because Davy Grant's been in hard fights in his last two fights, but he had a fight of the year against Marlon Vera. And if you know anything about fight of the year, it takes two to tango. So he must have had a fairly competitive fight with Marlon Vera, and it was. He lost. I'm not going to sit here and say I think Davy Grant beat Chito Vera, but he made a very good account of himself in that fight for being 36 years old. And like you said, did he beat Adrian Giannis? No. Should one of the judges give it to did. him? No. But, again, he looked really good for being a guy who I almost wait for Father Time to just creep up and hit him on the shoulder. He's been able to look like the same fighter throughout his last couple losses where I do feel like Smoka doesn't look like the same guy at this stage. So, I'm going to go on a callback because you put me in a mental pretzel. Wasn't Uh-Oh, the show that had Wink Yahoo on YTV where they used to go live? Is that the weird... Okay, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Is that the weird one where they'd have, like, the gimp throw people in a slime pool? <laughs> Yeah, that's that show. That's that show. If you're Canadian, things are going to get funky, froggy, fresh. <laughs> I was thinking about that. That guy had the worst was... haircut ever. The He looked like Jim Carrey with the mask on. And yeah, I swear to God, they had a Jack Gimp throw kiss into a pool with slime. It's like, isn't this The Undertaker? But we can't call him The Undertaker. No, he's like The Undertaker from Pulp Fiction in the basement of the convenience store. This episode went off the rails. But if you don't know what Uh-Oh! the TV show was, it was for kids, but it shouldn't have been. What? I remember they went live in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. I think it was at Magnetic Hill, and it was like, ah, I could go there, only they probably filmed that six years ago. So there's no way I can go there. I can still go to the zoo and Magic Mountain. Magnetic <laughs> Hill's nice. Wink Yahoo. Let's give a host a name. <laughs> he had the most ridiculous hairdo. Let's bring it back and get kind of funky fresh again. Davey Grant in this fight coming in, and listen, it hasn't been good the last two. Obviously, for Smolka, he gets a win over Teco Quinones to send him out of the UFC. So, for Davey Grant, open to minus 275, at about a minus 280 or thereabouts. For Louis Smolka, at a plus 220. If we have a look at the tabology vote, surprise to us as they are to you, I'm going to say over under 65% Davey Grant. I'll say over. I know he's a decent favorite, but uh, apparently everybody has him. 587 total votes, 89% Davey Grant, 20% by decision, 71% by knockout. For the 11% that have Smolka, 52% by decision, and a 22% knockout margin there. Matt, what would Wink Yahoo do? I don't want to know. Nightmare fuel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, I can't stress... How many drugs the creators of this show were on when they made it. It was very twisted. I like David Grant in this matchup, though. Here's the thing. The results might be different his last two times out, but the fighter isn't. He still looks like the same guy, and I do like that he is still durable in his last two fights. We know how hard Adrian Yanez and Marlon Vera both hit, and the fact that David Grant was able to stay competitive with those guys even later into that fight was very telling, as Craig remains thinking about a gimp on TV. Whereas Louis Smolka, I worry about him every single time, he gets hit clean on the chin. And I do think Davy Grant has a decided edge with his power punching. Why TV? Like, I was nine watching that show. That guy Carlos got the job at 19 and he kept on hosting till he was 55. Now he's on E! Like E! The TV network! E Canada! There's Carlos. 10 people who run the TV in Canada and they're on every show. Get me on television. But no, I agree with you. I do have SBG Bishop Auckland zone. David Grant in this matchup. Again, we talk about Team Oyama coaching Carlos Barza to a second straight 
strawweight championship. And listen, you also have Frank Camacho in this card, who's heavily favored to lose. And I guess so is Louis Smolka. But I do like Davy Grant mixing it up. Very, very good in both aspects. And once Davy Grant's on top, Louis Smolka can struggle in bottom positions. I know that was a career hallmark. It was against Casey Kenny, and I kind of beat that fed horse or fed that fed horse until it died. Until it reared its opposite head not ugly head opposite head because Smolka was able to get off a bottom position win a fight that against Teco Quinones but for me I do like Grant here so I'll leave it here both of us going with Bishop Auckland England's own there's a multiple headed horse in there somewhere <laughs> Davy Grant to get a win in the weirdest fight night picks video in the whole four years of the channel let us know down below uh oh <laughs> your folks beloved memories of that show growing up in Canada. If you did, if you're an American, look into it. And we've got a big time card coming up with two light heavyweight fights remaining. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. As we always say, let's get into it. Coming up this weekend, a light heavyweight banger between non-cardio kings in the co-main event. We have Superman. Oh, taking on the Hulk. So, realistically, we're in the DC universe. Normally, these two guys work together for Superman. Listen, there's no Solomon Grundy for the Hulk. There's no massive people, buildings, and, and inanimate they objects. They don't work together, by the way, Craig. One's in Marvel, one's in DC. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Wow, Craig, the Chad of the MMA world doesn't know what the Hulk and Superman are. All right, I'm not a comic book guy. But what I do know is that these two guys have a very interesting career trajectory so far in their extended UFC careers. I mean, for Ryan Spann, you might think about it. This guy seems like he's been around for a hot minute. He is a hot prospect. He's also 6-3, and three, split between a few fights with Dana White's Contender Series and a few in the UFC also the ranked fighter in this matchup. And for Ryan Spann, you look at the five on in, and I want to really highlight these fights. Finishes Devin Clark, a very good wrestler. He goes out there and has a split decision fight against Sam Alvey. That was bad. That's probably career low light, even though he won that fight. He knocks down Johnny Walker a few times. Who hasn't, though? Let's be honest. And gets finished. He then beats Misha Serkinov in a knock-him-out, drag-him-out quick fight. And then he takes on... Anthony Smith and in that fight it's a five round main event it's an odd poster because it's very green they don't normally go with green like that and listen S Span goes out there and gets behind Anthony Smith and picks him up like he's his younger big brother he picks him up wraps his arms between him walks him across the cage standing drops him down on his feet in front of Saif Saud as if he's presenting him with a present Anthony Smith turns around hits him with the left hand and wobbles him bad. And then from then on out, Smith dominates the fight. He takes Span down. Span gets back up. Then they strike a little bit more. Smith has more success. Smith gets down, dirty, finishes him by submission. Freewon Kutsalaba, much worse five on in. Wins sandwich between wildness. Finishes Khalil Roundtree. Loses to Magomed Ankalaya, but did he? Well, then he does wow. the second time. Then he has the split fight against Dustin Jacoby. I thought it was a draw. You can think what you want. And then after that, he beats Devin Clark by decision. But the biggest point that I have out of all of this, and I said something silly before the camera started to roll, Ryan Spann wins when the positions favor him. But once his game plan gets out of whack, it's like the whole universe is spinning on its head for Superman. To quote Eminem, Devin, <laughs> Devin Clark needed... A dentist, an oral hygienist after that fight. That was bad. His teeth got jacked up in that matchup. And it was, like, disturbing to see afterwards. But it was one of the more complete performances from Kutalaba in the UFC up until this point. Because he has had a lot of hype up until that point. But we've never really seen him look great for consistent periods throughout his UFC tenure. He'll look good a moment here, a moment there. And then overall, he'll probably lose the fight to the higher-ranked guy. But... When he does look good, he does look great. And that's the thing about Cute to Lava. When he does land those big power punches, he does have pretty good boxing combinations, at least early on in fights. So you do like it when he is able to string them together. The problem is, he's a much lesser version of himself in the second and third round of a fight than he is in the first. But that does have to be said for both guys in this matchup. And that's why this is one of those weird fights where if it ends in the first round, it could be like a match now, Brandon Royval fight of the night. If it goes all three rounds, though, I can almost guarantee you it will not be a fight of the night. Now, it is a strange matchup, though, because for Kutalaba, we hear about his wrestling so much and this wrestling background that he has. 
In some fights, he looks really good. In others, it doesn't. And I always question it when he's going to fight a guy, especially like Ryan Spain, who is almost in the same boat of sometimes your wrestling looks really good offensively, but we have seen him also struggle with offensive wrestlers himself. Ryan Spain, the, the whole UFC tenure, again, including the Dana White's Contender Series, losing to Carl Robertson, then getting a win. And obviously, we've seen Ryan Spann. When he loses to Robertson and when he lost to Johnny Walker, he's going for that takedown. His head's out there and the elbows are coming. And Ryan Spann goes, uh-oh. The, the, we're completely off the rails. And when we look at Yuan Kutsalaba, first round, Dustin Jacoby. Takedown, takedown, takedown. Tons of control time. I thought it was a 10-8. And then after that, Jacoby takes over. Now, what we have seen is Ryan Spann, longtime Fortis MMA guy, hasn't really switched things up too bad, just kind of tried to refine some of the techniques he's already good at. You look at his overall record, plenty of submission wins. This is my question, though. Shouldn't he change something up in a wholesale kind of way? I think he'd start pumping the jab a little bit more, working in the one-twos, keeping the head back, lean back a little bit. Like, that's what I'd like to see. A little bit more activity on the feet out of Spann. Because he's huge for the weight class. Yeah, to mix in those takedowns for Iwan Kutsalaba, this is the big thing. Moving things to Extreme Couture, another camp over there in the States. I love what I saw his last time out against Devin Clark, where first round, take down City. Second round, take down City. Third round, Devin Clark all over him, wins that round. But you look at the overall scores in that one. One judge had it 30-26, Kutsalaba. Another 29-26 for Kutsalaba. And then again, Judge Tony Weeks, 29-227 for Kutsalaba. So I look at this one as... Ryan Spann, can he snatch up a submission? If he's going to do it, this is the opportunity. Can you want Kutsalaba win by submission, decision, or by knockout in this one? Yeah, I could see all of those distinct possibilities here. I'd be surprised with a sub, to be completely honest. On either side, to be honest. Like, if either guy gets on top of their opponent, I just expect them to ground them out more than anything. Instead of fighting for a sub, just because I feel like both guys have the grappling defense to at least fight out of it a little bit, just because neither guy would say is top, top tier with their submission ability. I do agree with you, though. I do think stoppage or finish, or, sorry, or this going to a distance uh, is equal value. In my life, all I do is watch sports and the occasional television show, so of course, I'm not a comic book guy, and I mix up DC and Marvel, and somebody's tossing dislike to the video because I made a simple mistake. So to you, I apologize if you made it this long. The odds in this one, Superman Span open to plus 145, is now plus 170 or thereabouts. Free one Kutsalaba, the Hulk out of Moldova, open to minus 175, minus 210 as it stands. So the over-under on topology, surprise to us, it is you. I'm going to say over-under, 65% Kutsalaba. I'll say over. Odds would suggest over, slightly over. 609 total votes, 74% Kutsalaba, 81% by knockout for the 26% that have span, 58% by knockout. Matt, the pick here. Superman span, bigger, longer. Is he faster? Is he stronger? How many more rhymes can I make? Well, that's the end of that uh, whole sequence there. But Matt, for me, I like Iwan Kutsalaba with the grinding, grimy, wrestling type of saw. I like how he's cleaned things up with Extreme Couture. I do still worry about if he pushes that pace round one, round two, can he make it to round three? Or will he be able to get the finish in the first two rounds? So I do favor Kutsalaba in this fight. But if there's anybody that can stymie his style, it's a Ryan Spann. I agree 100%. I do like Kutsalaba in this fight. But these are two guys who have a lot of weaknesses in their games. And that's why you do notice them both struggle quite a bit when they do fight that top five kind of fighter. Because those fighters, they might specialize in one area. But they do have very well-rounded game plans for the most part. So they will always be able to find a weakness in the game plan of a Ryan Ryan Spin or a Kutalaba, but I do think this will be a fun co-main event, even though we both have Kutalaba winning. Both of us going with the Hulk Iwan Kutalaba representing Extreme Couture and Marvel versus DC's Ryan Spann, I'm going to commit that to memory so I don't make that faux pas once more. We have a big time main event coming up in this division. Jan Blahovic taking on Alexander Rakic. It should be an amazing one. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks. We always say, let's get into it. A big time main event coming up this weekend at light heavyweight we have the former champ looking to return to his former glory it's the polish power out of jan blahovic coming off that fight against glover to where he did end up getting submitted and it looked like with relative ease for Teixeira, and now blahovic taking on the big time prospect alexander rakic as always one half your host and duo Craig Allen, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Craig Allen FNP. With me to my left, to your right, as always, Matt Allen FNP on the respective socials. We make it very simple for you, and we want to hear from you. Let us know down below in the comments section who you have in this main event. We're going to touch on some of those comments.
comments that are in our YouTube community tab already. We post polls, we post videos, all sorts of great stuff over there. So if you're not subscribed, maybe you missed it, but you should check that stuff out nonetheless. When it comes to this fight in the light heavyweight division, you look at it for Blahovic, he is still ranked incredibly high in this weight class, and so is Rakic. Blahovic number one, Rakic number three. And for Rakic, the craziest part about it is people know how good he is. People know how big of a prospect he is. The only loss that he has in the UFC, a split decision to Volkan Uzdemir. He also dropped his debut as a pro in 2011. But I want to focus on the wins. I mean, Francimar Bajos, he beats him by decision. Justin Ledet, Devin Clark, Jimmy Manoa. Nice progression all the way up. And then... Anthony Smith by decision. Thiago Santos by decision. This fight, of course, originally booked a couple of months ago. Blahovic out due to injury. But if you checked out Blahovic's Instagram, he's training in the mountains like Rocky getting ready for Drago. So pretty cool to see out of Jan Blahovic. And I'll focus a lot on his camp as we move forward, Matt, in this one. But I just want to say... I'm glad that this fight was booked because I think the matchmaking is very good here. It is really fun because for Rakic, even though he has made it so far in the division, he still does feel largely unproven because most of his fights just go his way for the most part. He's able to dominate with his athleticism and with his wrestling because that's the thing that Rakic brings to the table. I know people made fun of Dominic Reyes for being like, hey, I played every sport in high school. I'm a pretty good athlete. Being a good athlete at the high school level is different than being like just a professional athlete type of athleticism. Rakic has the type of athleticism that makes you think he could play another sport and probably thrive at it if he was just given like six or eight months to train in that specific sport. He has a very high motor, really nice cardio for a guy who's as big as he is. It was a point that I... I Forget if I brought up with Ryan Spann or not five minutes ago, but Ryan Spann's huge for this weight division, but he moves like a guy who's pretty big for the weight division. Rakic has the movement of a middleweight, but he's built like a heavyweight, and I think that's why he's been so effective at this weight class. Now, against Blahovic, it's going to be a really weird fight, because to my credit, and trust me, I take a lot of L's on this channel, so every now and then I gotta praise myself. I thought Jan Blahovic was gonna blow the doors off Dominic Reyes when they fought for the title. He was a big underdog going into that fight, but I told anybody who would listen. Blahovic is the much more tactical striker, and Dominic can't take him down in this fight. Blahovic is too good of a grappler, and luckily it worked out in that fight. But here's the thing you have to realize if you have been watching Jan Blahovic for any length of time. He has good takedown defense to a certain degree. It's like the dam we have in our city. It's kind of crooked right now and doesn't work all that great. It's holding the water back, but you're kind of worried about it at all times. Jan Blahovic's takedown defense is like that. It can hold the water back. But if it starts to give up anything, he can be controlled on the mat. And I always go back to the Alexander Gustafson fight. It was a weird performance. Jan looks really good on the feet. He's boxing up uh, Alexander a little bit. But Gustafson has a lot of success with his offensive takedowns, with his ground pound from the guard. And ever since that fight, that's been in the back of my mind. As to, hey, Blahovic is a good grappler. He has submission wins. We've seen it in his fights even when he isn't able to get the submission. He is a fairly high-level grappler. But he can get held down in specific positions. And if Rakic does fight like the Rakic we've seen in his last couple performances, where, hey, I'm not going to play at range with my striking. I'm just going to go for the double leg takedown. I'm just going to make you feel my presence. I don't think Jan Blahovic can... I think he can hold up with that. So I would expect it to go to the scorecards if it is one of those grappling heavy fights. But I don't think Blahovic has the type of game to where he can get back up to his feet consistently for 25 minutes against the bigger, stronger, and much younger Rakic. I mean, realistically, you look at it for Jan Blahovic, and if anybody's a sick kick fan, it's like that, do you remember the time? Oh, I remember. The Phil Collins, Michael Jackson remix that he has. Do you remember... The time that Durkin took him down a whole bunch and beat him by decision, Pat Cummins. And in that fight, Blavich had a knockdown. But it was Pat already. Cummins just continuing, continuing. It was a storm of the takedowns. Pat Cummins, somebody's going to make a documentary on the barista's career to fighting Daniel Cormier. But I do look at it, you know, for Blavic. Very, very good striker when he's moving forward. Defensively sound. Defensively sound. Thiago Santos notwithstanding. But for Blahovic, it's just a story of coming back, overcoming the adversity. Lose to Santos. Then he has performance bonus. Left hook Larry over Luke Rockle. Beat Jacare Souza by split. Awful one of the more fight. boring fights you've ever seen. Finishes Beast in 25-8 in front of John Jones in a fight that happened in New Mexico, that was an oddball was one. a huge win for Jan. Beats though. Dominic Reyes to win the belt. Beats Israel Adesanya, which can't be understated. That was the last time we saw Alexander Rakic when he beat Thiago Santos by decision. And then loses to Glover Teixeira. And I talked about Mount Man, meh, meh, Mount Man himself, Jan Blahovic. But he's training with some interesting people. 
Izu Agono, somebody that I've talked about before on this channel, 18-2 and two kickboxer who didn't win his last fight with KSW, but whatever, he's starting to get up there in age. And for Rakic at American top team Zagreb with Anche Dalia, Yannick Bahadi, and Hatep Moeli, as well as I've, Ivan Urslan, Yannick Bahadi, training with Alexander Rakic for his camp, but also Jake Hadley, because they're at home, I guess. So, wild stuff, both guys on this card, but my, again... Alexander Rakic playing it safe his last two fights, implementing the wrestling. Can we see Jan Blahovic defend some takedowns and then make him pay on the feet? That's a big question. I agree to half of it. I, I agree to the second part of it. Yes, I, he can definitely make a pay for it on the feet. Jan Blahovic is one of the most technical strikers we've seen at this division. He's defensively sound, keeps his hands up. He gets a little reckless offensively sometimes, and that's how Santos is able to catch him on the retreat. But still, when Blahovic is just standing at range with his opponent, reading their reads, firing back his own shots, he always does a great job. Like, he outstruck Israel Adesanya for the most part in their fight. That tells you how good of a striker Jan Blahovic is. The problem is... Jan loses in a very specific way a lot of the times. So he can get controlled on the mat. How have we seen Alexander Rakic win his last two fights? Due to heavy amounts of ground control, I would love to see the Just Bleed Alexander Rakic we saw pre-Devin Clark fight because he was wild. He was going in there, knocking people's heads off, trying to throw the kitchen sink at them, and even being more offensive with his own ground and pound on the mat. But I just expect him to really overwhelm Jan with his grappling. And I've been on the Rakic train for a long time, and even I'm starting to get off. Just because we're not really seeing a progression in his game. He's just doing what we already know he's good at. So if he gets a big performance over Jan Blahovic, maybe he is able to get a title shot off of this because Jan is a former champion. But I think he does need to be impressive if he wants to secure that title shot. Yeah, I mean, for Rakic in the fight against Anthony Smith, just over 12 minutes control time in a 15-minute fight. That's damn good. Yeah, and Anthony Smith's a great grappler off his back. Very, very good grappler. I mean, he was able to get a big win over Ryan Spann. He was able to implement his grappling against Volkan Uzdemir, if you'll remember. But for Rakic, that fight against Thiago Santos, very timid. Some take down, some take down, and not a lot of control time. That was really the, the point there. And you have a lackluster win over Thiago Santos, maybe not a title shot, and that's why we do have this fight. So, I'm eager to see Rakic in a five-round atmosphere against Jan Blahovic. We've seen Blahovic in five-round fights, and we've seen him excel in those. Now we're going to throw it on over to you over in the community tab on YouTube. We try to throw these polls out there so you folks get the opportunity to respond back. And out of 1,100 total votes posted 13 hours ago, 50%. So everybody's split. all split. Bill is saying, I'm going to say Blahovic. Both have solid grappling, so I think it's... His powerful striking is going to give him the edge in this one, along with the championship level experience. Bob Bob saying Rakic has good wrestling as shown versus Smith. And despite what people who only watch his fight with Izzy may think, Jan is not a good wrestler, not a great wrestler rather. Feel Rakic is going to play it safe and take Jan down. Devin saying Rakic to fight extremely safe because of the threat posed by the legendary Polish power. Grind out unanimous decision. And I'm going to give it back to Ryan Talbot who's saying Jan's loss to Glover doesn't look great. I can't trust a man that just gave up like that. Oh boy. Ryan Talbot really hit home. So 50-50 on the votes from the Fight Night Picks fans. The odds. Blahovic open to plus 130, plus 140 right now. Rakic open minus 150, minus 170 at this point. So what is the overall pick here? So I like Rakic overall, but I'm going to lay out a game plan for Jan Blahovic to win because I think there's a very specific one. I don't think Rakic likes getting hit. I know that's not a hot take. No one likes getting hit, but uh, it's a very specific quality. Darren Elkins does. Darren Elkins loves it. Almost got a massive tattoo across his chest to signal to people that he is about this life and likes the damage. Whereas Rakic has a very artistic chest shoulder piece that would not uh, give that same impression. Think about Rakic, though. Again, I don't think he likes taking a lot of damage in his fights. And I do think if Blahovic can hurt him early, really make him pay for it like he was able to do against Dominic Reyes. Remember in that fight, he busted up the face of Reyes bad before he was able to knock him out. I think if he could hurt Rakic early, he would make him fight like a much different fighter. Make him that tentative version who would fight on the outside. But I'm going to bet on the younger guy who has used the uh, layoff to make some improvements in his game. Maybe we will see Rakic strike a little bit more, be a little bit more aggressive on the feet, work into his takedowns instead of just shooting for them out the gate. So my prediction will be Rakic, but even as the conductor of the Rakic hype train, I'm about to step foot off at the next stop. I really do need to see something big out of him to really believe he could eventually fight for a title. For Anthony Smith, the highs have been really high. The win streak when he moves from middleweight to light heavyweight, and then he's able to get the title shot and he could have won the fight. 
But he decided, listen, I'm not about that life and the illegal knee. I'm going to fight on, loses that fight. And since then, been up and down so far. So very good win there for Rakic. Keeping him down, holding him down. Very good grappler. Against the non-explosive Thiago Santos, the timid Santos that we've seen lately. A good quality win there for Rakic. Against Jan Blahovic, the explosivity is still there at 39. It's just how will that takedown defense hold up, especially as the fight goes on. Will the dam burst? Will it break? Will we see Rakic just rinse and repeat with those takedowns? I got to go with the guy that was a former champ in Jan Blahovic. I like him in this fight. And listen, I've been on the Rakic hype train too. This is the opportunity where I just got to go off for a little bit. I got to explore the city. And then when it comes back on, you're at Old Orchard right now. You're just looking around. You're having a nice little vacation. You don't want to go to Boston just yet. You're not ready for a big trip. Just something short for the day. We'll take that uh, down Easter and then ride it back onto the city as it goes on. Whether we go up to Freeport, Maine or down to Boston. That's a very, very specific reference to a very, very specific train only some will get it, but Matt, we're split on the pick in this one. You're going with Alexander Rakic. I'm going to go with the former champ, Inyan Blahovic, and we want to hear from you. Let us know down below in the comment section who you have for these fights. We absolutely love the engagement that goes on down in the comment section, and if you don't get a chance to watch the videos, there's always the podcast out there as well. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast, you can find us there. And if you rate and review and you do these things, it really does help out the channel. I know other people harp on it, but I will here, and I'm really looking forward to this card. We have question mark kicks two hours before the prelims, and that really does give us an opportunity to reflect on the fights, offer up those final picks and predictions, and that when that's when that chat goes like Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire in the mid-90s, just hitting dingers, and everybody's just lighting up the chat, and it's so much fun to watch and to comment with everybody. So Matt, I'm really looking forward to the fights coming up this week. It's a great card, and anytime you have a former champ fighting a top prospect in a division, you know it's going to make for a great fight. So, I know the predictions were great last weekend, but the fights certainly were, so I'm really excited looking forward to this week's card. Some big-time fights. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, and as we always say, let's, let's get, get into, into it. it.